Welcome, everyone. So glad to be here with all of you tonight. So glad we're going to have a great conversation. Should be a lot of fun. Got some interesting opening remarks for you, and I'm sure you've all got some great questions to ask me. So let's have a great conversation. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notifications bell. And away we go. ...of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. Welcome, everybody. It's so great to be here with all of you. Uh, should be a fun evening tonight. I'm trying to experiment with doing these streams at different times. Uh, I tend to like to do my streams pretty late at night. It's just after 8.30 p.m. Eastern here in New York City, where we are based. But, um, you know, I try to experiment with doing them at different times. I was doing afternoon streams, and, you know, I generally like to do them pretty late, where I start at 10 or 11. But, Last night we did 8.30, it was Sunday night, and you know, that kind of worked. Uh, so we're doing 8.30 now, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, but we'll just experiment with different times, right? Different times, it works, right? Sometimes we'll do it early, sometimes we'll do it late. I always try to give at least a two hour announcement that the stream is gonna happen, let people know, let people count down to it. That's how I like to do these things, so. We're just going to keep doing them. We're planning to do them every day if possible. I'll probably take a day off here and there, but we plan to do them every day because that's what, what we're doing here, right? We're streaming. Um, so hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the notifications bell. And let me emphasize the subscribe button. People continue to be unsubscribed against their wishes. They contact me about it. They resubscribe. So hit the subscribe button. Don't let the YouTube algorithms mess with us. Uh, also, be sure to hit the notifications bell because then you get notified, uh, notified every time that we do one of these streams. Uh, so there you go. Um, you get notified. I say notified uh, because it's notification, but I'm having fun. I'm playing with the English language there. But anyhow, um, you know, for those of you who may not be familiar with how these things tend to work, um, generally I give opening remarks. Uh, I talk about what it is that I want to talk about. And then after that, um, we do a roll call where I call everyone out in the chat, names and locations. We find out who it is on the other side of the camera, who is watching this, uh, and that's always fun. And then after that, I answer super chat questions for the rest of the evening. For those who may not be aware, we are streaming right now on Facebook. We are streaming right now on YouTube. And we are streaming right now on Rockfin. And afterwards, uh, these streams tend to upload on Rumble. I have synced up on Rumble. So you can watch these streams on rumble uh so yeah we're on different platforms uh and we're gonna keep going we're not going away we're just gonna keep going um and that's how this works um if you're looking uh for the you know the streams to be arranged by topic or category go and subscribe to the caleb moppin videos channel uh because that's the channel where i'm posting I'm posting, you know, clips from the recent streams. I can't post clips every day to my channel or else it'll ruin my notifications. Uh, but I can post every day on this small channel I created. Um, I created this small channel. Um, so you can go subscribe to Caleb Moppin Videos. We are just shy of 500 followers on that channel. 
Um, and that's where we post, you know, just little clips by topic of me answering people's questions or whatnot. And that's on there. Ooh, what's this Twitter WikiLeaks? What is this? What is this? What is this? Uh, WikiLeaks editor in chief, Kristen of Strawn speaks to Glenn Greenwald. Got it. Got it. All right. Very good. And, um, and I also thought it might be worth mentioning, uh, that, you know, we're trying to do these every night if possible. Um, you know, but, uh, if you really want to be part of this community and support the work that we do, uh, we appreciate Patreon support. So we do have a Patreon page. Patreon members, uh, they get invited to special patrons only streams that we do multiple times a month at this point. It started out, we were just doing them once a month, but we're, we're doing them more often. So if you want to support the work we do, you can go join the Patreon. And if you want to be involved in the activism and the building of the educational work, the educational project, the Center for Political Innovation that prints books and builds conferences and events around the country. You can become a dues paying member of the Center for Political Innovation. We have weekly general membership meetings to find out about our current operations, answer people's questions. So we got that going on for those of you that want to be involved in in that whole process. So that's how I, those are the quick business announcements I wanted to make. Uh, you will notice that after these streams are over, I add a number. Uh, this is stream number 439, but right now it just says Monday night conversation, but it, it will be, um, it will be given a number and then I will change the title of the stream from Monday night conversation. I'll change it to something about what we're talking about. Uh, and that'll make it easier for people to find things. Cause that's been an ongoing source of frustration. People have said, why don't you, uh, why don't you just, um, you know, give us some topics through which we can find what we're looking for. Um, and so we're going to do that after I change it to live number 439. It'll also have whatever we end up talking about tonight. So that's how it works. Uh, so if there's something you want me to talk about in the second half of the show. Shoot me a super chat. Super chats are what makes the second half of the show so lively. I'm here to answer your questions. And on that note, I will begin my opening remarks. So I guess I'll just jump into them. Folks, there are no shortcuts in life. There generally are no shortcuts. And that's part of the illusion that I think a lot of people fall into nowadays. We are kind of programmed to believe that there are shortcuts in life, right? That you're going to win the lottery. You're going to be discovered if you work in, you know, in, in Hollywood or in acting or in, in entertainment, you're going to be discovered, right? You're going to win the lottery. You're going to uh, hit the jackpot. And somehow there's some, how there's going to be a shortcut in which you will go from zero to hero You'll have absolutely nothing, and then boom, you'll have absolutely everything. That's how we're programmed to think about things. And it's wrong. There are no shortcuts. There are moments where things that have been building up for a long time kind of burst forth suddenly. That's not a shortcut, right? They talk about the straw that broke the camel's back. They talk about, you know, the dike suddenly there's one little leak and then there's another and then boom, the dike, you know, there, there's a flood, right? That there are moments where quantity and equality, et cetera, things just break, break open. But when they do, they're the result of a long period of plugging away and plugging away and plugging away and plugging away. And that there are very, very few circumstances where things just instantly happen. And that that is not the way we're trained to think about things, right? We want it to be like a Hollywood movie. We want it to be exciting. We want it to be all of a sudden, everything changes so dramatically. 
That is not generally the way things happen. And that if we're going to be serious about building a political movement in the United States, if we're going to be serious about spreading these ideas and getting anti-imperialism and socialism among the broad masses of people, we just kind of have to have a long-haul perspective. We have to think of things, think of things in a long-term way and understand that while we might gain here, we might gain there, and we might have a setback here, we might have a setback there, that ultimately, until things completely are ripe, it's going to be just a gradual, gradual growth. That's generally what it's going to look like. Again, it won't be completely even. It won't be like every day we gain here and gain. It won't be like that. There will be sudden surges ahead. There will be sudden setbacks. But until the moment where things ultimately come to their head, it's going to be more or less, more or less slow. And I've been thinking about a lot of different things in regards to this. I've been thinking about Yi and his interview with Alex Jones. I've been thinking about Charlottesville and the alt-right and the demise of the alt-right. I've been thinking about January 6th and what happened with January 6th. Um, I've been thinking about those things. And if you look at those events, and if you look at how things happened, January 6th, Charlottesville, and now I look at what's going on with Kanye, there's something... There's a pattern that we need to pay attention to. And this, this may not even sound like it even applies to us in any conceivable way. right? This might sound like, Caleb, you're talking about people on the far right. Caleb, you're talking about Donald Trump, who was a president, who was kind of a Bonapartist. Caleb, you're talking about a rapper who was anti-Semitic and now had a meltdown. You might think this doesn't apply, but in a weird way, it does. You see... Marxism is an actual political movement. And I've made this point many, many times. That when I go to countries around the world that have a strong communist party. It is a completely different thing than what we have in the United States. The communist parties around the world that have a huge amount of influence, they have neighborhoods that they control. They have people on a local level who meet every day and talk about the problems in the neighborhood and in the community and how to carry out the revolutionary agenda in their neighborhood and in their community. Uh, they have members of the elected bodies that are meeting with the Marxist leaders and talking to them. They have community organizations that are keeping track of everything locally in the neighborhood. That where Marxist and revolutionary groups have influence in the developing world, you know, you go to India where communists control the entire region of Kerala. You go to Latin America where you have communist you know, governments that are in power, or you have other countries where the communists, maybe they're not in power, but they have a huge amount of influence. They have huge political organizations. You're, you're dealing with groups that are what I would call real movements, that have real roots among the population. They have geography that they control. They have neighborhoods you know, just like in America, we have the red states that are for the Republicans, the blue states that are for the Democrats. In areas where communists actually matter, there is the neighborhood where the communists are in power. There is the region where the communists matter. Like there are, there are geographical areas that are communist strongholds. That is something we don't have in the United States.
That is something we just do not have in the United States. We don't have a real movement. We have a lot of people engaging in intellectual ideas. We have people who attend protests, mainly liberal protests, and try to push for communism within them. We have a lot of people on the internet doing things, you know, but we don't have a real communist movement in the United States. And the ruling class has done everything in its power to make sure we don't have that. During the 1930s, in most major cities in the United States, you did have that. In Brooklyn and in Harlem, New York City in the 1930s, you had communist communist areas, right? In, in Brooklyn, there were whole neighborhoods where the Communist Party had a stronghold. In Harlem, the two members of the New York City Council, uh, Peter Cushoni and Benjamin Davis, were members of the Communist Party. Uh, in addition to that, you had um, Vito Marcantonio, the the member of the American Labor Party who was elected to Congress, who was a very close friend of the Communist Party, was in the House of Representatives. In Minneapolis, you had a very close friend of the Communist Party who was elected to Congress, and Minneapolis was very much, it was it was divided between the Trotskyite communists and the, and the Communist Party USA, but they basically ran Minneapolis. They had the power in that town. Uh, you know, San Francisco, the dock workers and Harry Bridges. And, and you know, if you went around the country, especially Chicago, Chicago was definitely a communist stronghold. You went around the country. There were areas that the communists controlled, and they were mainly in major cities. And it was among recent immigrants from Eastern Europe and Ireland, uh, Italian-Americans um, and some of the big sections of the black community. And it was in major cities throughout the United States, major industrial cities. They had a stronghold. And you could say the same thing about the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party, you know, at one point during the late 60s and up until like the late 70s, there were areas where the, the Black Panther Party had had influence and control. You went to certain places. You went to certain places, you went to certain neighborhoods, and the Black Panthers were running the show. And everyone in the neighborhood knew who the Black Panthers were, and the local Black Panther organizers were known by everyone in the neighborhood, and elected officials had to have an alliance or compromise somehow with the Black Panthers. You could say Detroit was like that during the 70s as well. There was It wasn't the Black Panthers, but it was something called the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, and Kenneth Cockrell, and 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 the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, and that, that there was something like this. And it was only in major cities, and in the 70s, it was really only among the black community, but they had some influence. You know, and if you go even further back, you know, at one point, you know, the Reds ran Oklahoma. You ever hear about the Green Corn Rebellion, right? In Oklahoma, right, the, the Wobblies, the IWW, they were a very big current among the population. They organized the small farmers. The Socialist Party was very popular. And when World War I happened, the, the, in Oklahoma, there was an armed uprising called the Green Corn Rebellion. And, you know, it was supported by the majority. Basically, it was an attempt to say we're not going to be drafted. And if you try to draft us, we're going to shoot you. I mean, it was, you know, these Oklahoma farmers took up guns and they, there was kind of an armed uprising that was supported by various layers of the local government in Oklahoma, because Oklahoma in 1910 and 1915 was communist territory. It was it was that we don't have anything like that in the United States right now. All right. We just we just don't have that. I mean, it just doesn't doesn't exist. Um, and it will exist eventually. We will get there again as the crisis intensifies. We will return to this state of being. But it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. And in order to understand why it's going to be a while, you have to understand this point. And I'm, the way I'm talking here is it's like, it's like in order to understand this, you have to understand this. And in order to understand this, you have to understand this. There's layers to what I'm saying here. So bear with me if this is confusing, but, but we'll get to the point. But like the closest thing that I ever saw to what a real communist party looks like, I saw when I was living in Cleveland. Uh, you know, after college, I was living in Cleveland, living on the east side of Cleveland. And there was an organization called Black on Black Crime Incorporated. Uh, and this was an organization. It was, a, it was not a communist organization by any means. It was a black nationalist NGO, nonprofit, that its goal was basically to stop gang violence. Uh, it was an NGO, but they functioned like this. Every Wednesday night, they had a meeting 
Uh, and there would be 80, 90, maybe even 100 people that would come to their meeting every Wednesday. And they would talk about the traffic lights and the cost of rent in the neighborhood. They would talk about all kinds of things. And then when there was gang violence, they would negotiate. And when there was police brutality, they would go to court with the victims. They were a, a, a center of community power in the black community. And the leader of it was a guy named Art McCoy, who had a radio program. Uh, he was the owner of a barber shop in the neighborhood, and he had a radio program. And he was a black nationalist, and he convened this black nationalist organization on the east side of Cleveland that had a lot of influence. It had a lot of influence in Cleveland. Everyone in the black community knew who he was. Uh, he convened these meetings that that addressed the needs of the community and that was the closest thing. If you, you know, in the 1930s, if you were in a communist area, that's what the communist party was. If you were in, you know, in, in the 1970s, if you were in an urban black community, that's what the black Panthers were. They were this center of community power and people were going to this organization to get their needs met. Uh, people were, were being educated about politics by this organization, right? The black Panthers or the communist party would teach people communism, uh, teach people Marxism and lead them in asserting their needs in the community. Right. And I mean, black on black crime incorporated, they were not Marxists, but they would convene hip hop workshops. They would convene other events where they were teaching people black nationalism. Uh, and they would, they would address and, and lead the community to assert its needs. Right. And interact with elected officials, interact with the police, et cetera. Right. This is, this is how, real political power works. This is what real political power looks like. This is what real political power looks like, is you have a geographical area where you, uh, your political force, whether it's the, the communists or the nationalists or, the, or the, the socialists or the Islamists or the Christians or whatever they are, whatever it is, if you have a real political movement, that is what it looks like. And, you know, before... Bolivarian socialism took power in Venezuela. The communists in Venezuela had this. There were neighborhoods where, you know, as Venezuela was implementing austerity uh, in, in the 90s, uh, you know, the, they would lose the electricity, right? The electricity would go off. And so the communists in the neighborhood would organize a strike and nobody in the neighborhood would go to work until they fixed the power. And then the government would be forced to fix the power or when the, the garbage wasn't being collected. Right. Uh, when the garbage wasn't being collected, uh, they would be in the neighborhood and, you know, they would start picking the communists would pick up the garbage and then they would dump it on a major highway near a rich neighborhood. And that would force the government and the powers that be to say, OK, and then they would start collecting the garbage. They would do things like this where the whole community knew who the local Communist Party organizers were, went to them with their concerns. They're constantly convening community meetings, teaching people Marxism. Classes are going on where they're teaching people their ideology. And at the same time that they're teaching people their ideology, they're also organizing people to assert their needs on a community level, right? That is what communist groups, revolutionary groups that have the potential to take power that's what they looked like, right? Before the Islamic Revolution, the Khomeinists, they played a similar role, right? The, the Muslim imams, they, they, would, they served that role in the Islamic community. Uh, in, in the neighborhoods in Iran, you know, they were, they were having meetings of the community and teaching them Islam, but also, you know, asserting the needs of the community. And, and you know, I mean, many parts of the world, that when there are revolutionary organizations, that is what they look like. And right now in the United States, we have nothing that looks remotely like that. Nothing, right? Um, we just don't, right? And there's a reason for that, right? And the reason for that is that the ruling class of the United States knows this. They know that when, when you have what's, what's basically referred to by Vladimir Lenin is what's called dual power. When community assemblies are being formed, when there is some other political force that is pulling levers and pulling the strings of power and has power on the community level, that is how you move towards some kind of revolutionary situation. And they know that that is the case. And so they have worked very, very hard to make sure that that does not happen. And they have worked very, 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 very carefully and very, very sure to, to make sure it doesn't happen. The groups have been infiltrated. Fred Hampton was killed in his apartment with a hail of bullets uh, you know, all kinds of efforts have been made. You know, they've, they've set up fake community organizations that are controlled by the Democratic Party. They've, they've done all kinds of things to make sure that no 
revolutionary organization is able to just set up shop and start functioning in local neighborhoods and and operating this way. Right. And most revolutionary groups, most groups in the United States that call themselves Marxists or socialists, um, they they most of them don't even have any aspiration to be this. But some of them do. Some of them do know this is what you're supposed to be, but they are so weak and they are so small and they have such little you know, influence. They're not even able to pull that off. Um, and so they're just kind of they remain irrelevant. And that's the situation we're in. However, the USA is entering a long term economic crisis. The U.S. economy has crashed. Living standards are going down. The ruling class are fighting with each other. And as the ruling class fight with one another, they start to recruit workers and working class people to be their foot soldiers in battles with other sections of the ruling class. Right? This is Bonapartism. Amid a capitalist crisis, one section of the ruling class seeks to seize control of the government to beat back another section of the ruling class. And you have you have struggles to take control of the government. One section of the ruling class is fighting another section of the ruling class. And working class people are brought into politics to be the foot soldiers of one section of the ruling class against another. That is how capitalist crises tend to develop, right? And you have, you have, you know, fascist groups working for one section. You have leftist or socialist groups working for another section. You have, you have various, various mobilizations of the population, which they are being used to have the back of one section of the capitalist class against another section of the capitalist class, right? And that's what you have in a time of capitalist crisis. You have a fight within the ruling class. You have you have the ruling class needing, you know, one section of the ruling class needing to assert power over another. Uh, and you you have then the population being drawn into politics as a way for the ruling class to fight amongst themselves. And that is what gives birth to different kinds of movements. And so the ruling class of the United States is gradually coming to terms with the fact that they can't function in the old way. The old American way of doing things from the time of the Cold War up into today is that most, most Americans are politically not involved. They don't think about politics, economics, or whatever. They're thinking about football and baseball and bowling. They're thinking about, you know, celebrity gossip, and they're, they're thinking about how they're going to, you know, remodel their kitchen or what their daughter's wedding is going to look like, and that... The way the ruling class of the United States has ruled since since the 1950s has been to keep people out of politics. The idea has been that average Americans are comfortable enough uh, that they see have enough of a decent living standard that, that we can assume that, yes, every four years they will vote for the president. They'll vote for the Democrat or Republican to be president. But for the most part, most average Americans are not involved in politics. They're just living their lives. They're just focused on their own personal stuff. They're focused on, you know, you know, short term figuring out how they can live or they're being entertained by the television or they're, you know, th th for the most part, they're tuned out of politics. That is the way the ruling class the United States has been operating since the beginning of the Cold War. And it worked for a long time because the USA had a very strong economy and people didn't people politics wasn't confronting people. People didn't have to worry about politics. People were able to get a decent job and that, yes, certain sections of the population, like the black community, were highly politicized. You had a layer of intellectuals and college students who were politicized. You did have the Vietnam War where young men were being drafted and didn't want to go. And so then they were confronted with politics. But for the most part, the way the United States was held together was that average Americans Black, white, Arab, Asian, Latino were not thinking about politics. They were just kind of chilling out and enjoying a high standard of living. And the ruling class was able to stay in power. And there was a kind of consensus among the ruling class. Ronald Reagan said, we're all friends after six o'clock, meaning that, that at the end of the day, there wasn't that much of a difference between the Democrats and Republicans. They might fight with each other in the short term, but they had kind of a gentlemanly agreement that we're all on the same page here against the communists and against the Russians and the Chinese or whatever. And that was how American politics operated. But then you'll recall that there has been an economic crisis and living standards in the United States are drastically decreasing. 
and the country's roads are falling apart. They are unpaving the roads in 27 different states right now. They are pulling up, pulling up the asphalt and pulverizing it and replacing paved roads with dirt roads. And there's a huge opioid epidemic and people are dying in mass. And there is a dropping standard of living. There is a rise in dissident ideas among the population. People are interested in conspiracy theories. People are interested in the history of protest movements. People are, you know, are, you know, conspiracy opposing the government, thinking that the government is run by some secret shady group. The population isn't happy. The uh, the neighborhoods of the suburbs are full of empty, foreclosed homes. Uh, the generation, the next generation is is gripped by debt. Uh, living standards are going down. The population is angry, so they can't afford to do that anymore. They can't. Average Americans are like, something's wrong, and we want to do something about it. And so... The ruling class is trying to manage that, and they are fighting among each other. There's a big divide in the ruling class between the the centers of power, Silicon Valley, and and the big four super major oil companies and the intelligence agencies versus the military-industrial complex and Betsy DeVos and and, you know, lower level capitalists, there's kind of a push and pull, there's a power struggle among the American elite, and they're fighting with each other. And average Americans are furious that things just keep getting worse, and they want action to be taken. And there's a moment where they need to kind of, on the one hand, they need to settle scores among themselves. And on the other hand, they need to get the masses who want change and are going to increasingly get involved in different movements to try and bring about that change. Uh, they, you know, they need to be led. Someone needs to point them toward doing something. So what we have seen over the course of the last couple decades, what we have seen is an attempt to stave off an actual movement from developing. It has been an attempt to kind of mimic movements in the hopes of keeping Americans out of politics. The Bernie Sanders campaign was a great example of that. We had a socialist who was running for president who was saying left-wing populist things, all kinds of people around the country. There was like an upsurge of support for Bernie Sanders because people around the country were mad at at income inequality and the deteriorating of the country, student debt, health care costs, et cetera. Um, You know, um, good question. And um, wrote it down and keep the super chats rolling in. Right. That's what our second half of the show is about. And there was an upsurge of support for Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump got elected in 2016. And, you know, there was an upsurge of support for him. And, you know, he had like the march for Trump and he was kind of building a layer of support among the population, building up kind of right wing movements to support him. Uh, And there was like elements of 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 having some kind of movement, but it was really not a movement. It was just get our guy in office, get him elected. And once he's elected, things will change. And of course, Trump got into office. Things didn't change. The elections were rigged against Bernie Sanders. And then he didn't tell, he told his followers to just accept whatever and vote for Hillary Clinton. And neither of those things were real. However, there have been some anti-establishment movements that have emerged from beneath the surface. And honestly, at this point, most of them have been right wing. But they have existed among the far right wing groups of people that are heavily armed, groups of people that are at odds with the U.S. power structure. There have been some developments of, you know, forces that have ideas that are at odds with what American imperialism wants. And we have watched the ruling class manage, manage these developments. First example, right, the alt-right, right? If you're a regular leftist, you just say, well, the alt-right was a conspiracy by the capitalists. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. The alt-right, as awful as it was, it was a movement. It was on the internet and it was young men that have resentment, that don't like the identity politics, that don't like the woke makeover of the United States. It was young men mainly exploring far right 
fascistic ideas, white nationalism, fascism, uh, you know, various, it was, you know, libertarian free market economics, racial pseudoscience. It was, there was kind of a, a spontaneous upsurge of young white men who were feeling alienated from U.S. society because they were feeling alienated from U.S. society, they became interested in ideas that are forbidden by the U.S. political establishment and are at odds with the interests of American imperialism, right? Um, a lot of them were thinking things like Russia's the great white homeland, and they know nothing about Russia's international relationships and how close Africa is, or Russia is with African countries and whatever, or that they think China is somehow fascist. It's just fascism. It's national socialism for the, the Han Chinese. They're wrong, okay? They don't know what they're talking about. But, you know, they're operating, they're coming out of a right-wing background. They're operating on the assumption that communism is pure evil. They're operating on the assumption, you know, on the basis of having resentment against people of color, against women, against LGBT folks, etc. Um, you know, talk about chapter three, not four. Uh, you know, they're having some resentment, um, you know, against about the woke makeover that U.S. society is having. So you have these young white men that were interested in fascist ideas. Well, there have been fascist groups in the United States for many years. The American Nazi Party, the National Socialist Movement, the um, what is it called? The National Alliance, National Vanguard, uh, you know, the Council of Conservative Citizens. White supremacist fascist organizations have existed in the United States for a very long time. Um, you know, but those groups have always been fringe and irrelevant. However, in response to this kind of upsurge of young white men who were getting interested in fascistic ideas. And often that led them to be so at odds with the American political establishment, they would do things like praise North Korea or whatever. In order to manage it, something came into existence called the alt-right. And the alt-right was not the American Nazi party. It was not the National Socialist Movement. It was not the National Vanguard or whatever. The alt-right was made for social media. Richard Spencer, Augustus Sol Invictus. These were internet entertainers who espoused an alt-rightish message. But it was not very politically coherent. You know, if you listen to the American Nazi Party, you listen to those folks, they know what they're all about. They are racist. They, they deny the Holocaust. They, they have a certain worldview. They want this. They, they have a very coherent message. These guys didn't. Richard Spencer would get up there and his, his, I'm an edgelord voice. Yes, I am proud to be white. Yes, yes, doesn't it offend you? I don't know that the Holocaust happened. How do you know? I mean, he talks like this. I mean, if you listen to Richard Spencer talk, he actually talks in this like, wow, are you a, a Offended by my existence? Yes. I, don't know. I mean, I mean, he actually sounds like that, right? Richard Spencer is a very, very wealthy young guy that they found to be the rodeo clown, to be the internet, you know, internet entertainment to kind of corral and lead these young white men who had these, these anti-establishment ideas, you know, and, and he was just this very, very, he's from a very, very wealthy family. And he's one guy and he, they would dress him up in fancy clothes and they had high produced, high quality, very expensive videos. And he got on there and he said, what? and, and it, he gave this kind of vague, very incoherent white nationalist message. And then, you know, various people liked him and then they had Augustus Invictus and I debated Augustus Invictus and he was another one of these. Now, unlike Richard Spencer, who talked like this, you know, I debated Augustus Invictus, right? And I mean, he was just as incoherent, right? It was like this goth thing and he sacrificed a goat and he went off into nature and I shall come. I mean, you watch my debate with Augustus Invictus. What the hell does he stand for? Nobody knows. He stands for like weird pagan traditional religion and anti-communism. And I, I mean, it was, it's incoherent. Augustus Invictus is completely incoherent. But he was one of these, rodeo clowns whose social media exploded 
right? And he, you know, had all these elaborate, you know, complicated interviews with Vice and they were building him up. And he, he put out this kind of incoherent message that was racist and fascist and pagan and supremacist and whatever, right? And, you know, instead of building organizations, they didn't build organizations on uh, the alt-right, right? It wasn't like the American Nazi party just started recruiting. Oh, no, 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 wasn't that. Uh, it wasn't that, you know, the, the, you know, the national vanguards or what, no, 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 no. They found these various clowns, usually very, very wealthy kids who didn't want to have, didn't want to have to have a real job and were probably very well connected. There were probably people within the government apparatus that, you know, that, that knew relatives of theirs, family members and said, all right, this is the guy for the job. And and they put them up there as they were they were the representatives of white nationalism. Right. And they were up there and they were the various clowns. And instead of organizing some kind of alt right movement, they organized people on the Internet to watch these clowns. And listen to these clowns put forward a very incoherent incoherent kind of fascist kind of you know definitely racist definitely offensive but not really ideological message with their various clowns and these clowns performed and and the liberals were outraged about how horrible these clowns were and these you know these clowns were were revving up people in the trump movement and if you were in the trump movement you'd eventually you know hear about one of these clowns but then after Trump got elected president, they had Charlottesville, right? And they did the Charlottesville thing. And all of these clowns assembled in one place and they got all the leftists to assemble in one place. And, you know, a guy was driving his car around. There was violent. I mean, we all know what happened at Charlottesville. A police helicopter crashed. Some guy was driving his car into people. And they had an episode of, of violence and that was the end of the alt-right and that's really the alt-right is done it's done i mean it's over right all the all the clowns of the alt-right are all crippled they've got debt they're they've been sued out the ass they're going to be paying paying you know lawsuit settlements for the rest of their lives um you know uh the political organizations of the alt-right have been broken up by the government and that was the end of the alt-right the alt-right was, it was there as a mechanism for making sure a real movement of far-rightists didn't emerge. That's what it was there to do. It was there to make sure that in light of all the political problems and anger and in light of the upsurge of fascistic and white supremacist ideas among a certain, certain section of the population, it was there to basically manage it and then lead it off a cliff. And it did. And it led them off a cliff. And now Richard Spencer is just some guy on the internet who's, you know, he's got like Twitter spaces where he talks about, about different things. And, you know, he tries to, he wanted me to debate him at one point and I didn't, I wasn't interested. Uh, you know, and he's just, he's nobody now. Right. And Augustus Invictus, what is he doing? No one knows what he's doing. Right. I mean, and there's other names I could mention. They've just kind of vanished into obscurity. The whole thing, the whole thing just kind of spiraled downward into nothing. And the reason that it spiraled downward into nothing, I will add, again, not endorsing anything about what these people are about, but I'm just explaining what happened, is because the whole thing was a shortcut. The whole thing was a shortcut. It was there to tell adherents of the far right, you don't have to build a real movement. You don't have to build an organization that has roots in communities. You don't have to actually set up political infrastructure. All you need to do is listen to these clowns, listen to these clowns perform, go and watch this clown show, and eventually, uh, you know, it'll influence debate, blah, 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 blah. And so... A lot of these young men that were bought into these alt-right ideas, they they followed their favorite clown. You know, they followed Spencer or Invictus or one of them. And they followed them to Charlottesville. 
people got hurt, people got sued, people, you know, and, and, and that was the end of that. The shortcut proved to not be a shortcut. For the alt-right, the shortcut was actually, it was actually a path off a cliff. And the, the danger that was posed to the establishment of all these young men developing anti-establishment racist ideas, uh, it was abetted, right? They, they had various entertainers who entertained them, led them to a place to become very, very hated and humiliated and, and disabled, you know, politically disabled. And, and now the alt-right is gone. And it's it's scattered. I mean, there's there's people that used to be part of the alt right that are converting to Russian Orthodoxy. There's a, a traditional Catholicism thing that's very popular. There's people that used to be part of the alt right that are you know that are just you know they're doing the oh you know I I I you know there's what's his name the the kid who used to be part of the alt right is now a bread tuber. Faraday speaks. Oh you know I I mean but it's it was just it was it was a, a clever diversion, a clever diversion to take a, a, a strange anti-establishment current and lead it to a place where it would do no harm. And, and now it has this, this anti-establishment current has been broken up and now they've got Jordan Peterson. You know, they've done lots of research into what made a young person join the alt-right, the resentment against feminism, the, you know, the longing for some kind of father figure, et cetera. So then they found Jordan Peterson and now Jordan Peterson's up there and, and he's the gentle father figure who loves them, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and, and he, and they ask him about incels and he cries, oh, these young men, you know, you know and it's, it's, and they got Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is just espousing your typical, typical anti-communism, typical anti-communism mixed in with like self-help advice, advice. And so now all the young men who have this kind of resentment, um, all those young men, now they go and they follow Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson leads them to be conservative, be Republican, and they're not a threat to the status quo. And alt-right is done, right? And the reason that alt-right is done is because rather than sink its roots into the community, which is what fascist groups tend to do around the world, just like communist groups, fascist groups also tend to sink their roots into communities. You go to Greece, the Golden Dawn is a fascist group. It sunk its roots into the community. Well. You know, the alt-right, it got diverted away from sinking its roots into the community. It got diverted, diverted away from, from, you know, building actual organizations, actual far-right fascist parties. And it became, it dissolved into nothing. January 6th is a similar kind of development. You had President Donald Trump and he was president. And for the most part, he governed kind of standard, you know, lowered taxes on the rich. But there were a couple moments where he did things that the U.S. establishment didn't like. And there were a lot of average Americans that liked the idea. Here's a guy who's the president of the United States, and he calls CNN fake news, and he talks about the military-industrial complex. And there was there was a, a, a kind of among Americans that are alienated by the political process, there was a weird identification with Trump. And I, I, as someone who had went to Trump rallies, someone who's, you know, I, I mean, I actually interacted with Donald Trump and I mean, it's, it's, you start to identify with him, right? Because they're smearing him every day and they're attacking him on a personal level and they're going after him and you hate the American media. You hate the American elite and they're attacking Donald Trump and he's up there and he's like, yeah. And he's tweeting every, it was, I mean, you couldn't help but sympathize with Trump. If, if you were, some kind of anti-establishment person, as awful as Trump was, you couldn't help but on some level identify with him. If you're at odds with the American establishment and you see him fighting the American establishment, on some level, you kind of identified with him. As, as uh, you know, and a lot of Americans did. A lot of them were sympathizing with Trump, thinking Trump is fighting the elites. Uh, Trump is fighting the establishment. You know, you know, um, you know, they're, they identified with him. And so Donald Trump was president. The pandemic happened there. You know, he was he on and off was fighting with the neoconservatives. He did the North Korea thing. And then John Bolton, you know, tried to wreck the North Korea thing. And then ultimately John Bolton, one of the main neoconservatives, got booted out of the Trump's administration. 
Um, and after that, you know, you know, Trump was doing different things and, and one thing led to another and there was, and we come around to the 2020 election and Donald Trump lost. And a lot of Trump's followers believed it was rigged. And they believed it was rigged against Donald Trump. And so January 6th happened. Now we don't know exactly what caused January 6th to happen the way it did. We don't know. Right. We do know that Donald Trump said to his supporters, I'll meet you at the Capitol. So it looks like he was anticipating some of his supporters going into the Capitol. Uh, but then we also know that there were FBI informants and, you know, there's questions about re regardless. We saw what happened on January 6th, which is a bunch of Donald Trump supporters got into the U.S. Capitol, made utter fools of themselves. And then the just like Charlottesville, the government jumped on top of that. And, you know, they've been talking about January 6th as if it is the most important event in the history of the United States. And they've jumped on top of it. Trump was banned from all social media outlets. And they did a really, really good, you know, right? They did a really, really good job of basically breaking up Donald Trump's movement, breaking Trump away from a lot of his supporters in the Republican Party and the establishment, sending the FBI to crush various groups, locking up and jailing a lot of Trump supporters. Um, you know, they did a very, very good job with January 6th of, you know, Donald Trump and, and his movement is significantly weakened. Now, some people think they could come back, and I think there's a chance that they could come back. But Donald Trump is also pretty old, and, you know, it's it looks like they did a really, really good job of weakening. Again, it was a shortcut. It was a shortcut. Donald Trump's supporters, they didn't dig their roots into the community. Donald Trump did not engage in activities that would dramatically improve the lives of average Americans. He did not, you know, he did not take dramatic action to fix the lives of average Americans. They didn't build a movement that had support in every neighborhood where you had a, a Trump community assembly that was, or they didn't do that. It wasn't a real movement. It was Donald Trump was a clown, a clown that they've had on primetime television for years. He got elected president. He got elected president. and from from the White House, he gave incoherent, incoherent messages. You know, you know, I am totally in support of Israel. I am totally in support of Israel. It's really awesome, man. And like, do they want a two state solution? They want a one state solution. They're going to get everything they want, man. They're going to get everything they want. I am the president of the United States. It's going to be going to be amazing. I mean, it was just incoherent gibberish. I mean, it was like, what did he stand for? What did he believe? You know. Uh, I am the leader of the silent majority. It is so amazing. I mean, he was, it was incoherent. He gave an incoherent, non-ideological message. Right? People said Donald Trump was a fascist. No, he wasn't. Fascism is a very clear, you know, clear, ideologically coherent message. It's not a good one, but Donald Trump wasn't doing that. He was all over the place, just like... Just like those people uh, in the uh, in the alt right, just like Augustus Invictus, just like Richard Spencer, you know, just I mean, it, it was this incoherent message, but kind of against the establishment. It was it was a presidency that didn't really fight the status quo in the United States. It said things that people didn't like. There were times where they were push and pull and he was pushing back and fighting with different factions. For the most part, nothing really changed as a result of Donald Trump being president. Nothing. Um, and then to top it all off, um, his supporters got led off of a cliff. They had their Charlottesville. They had January 6th, where after a long incoherent movement uh, after people not really being taught like an ideology or a belief system. And after not really sinking their roots in there, but just putting on a, a lengthy clown show, they all got let off of a cliff. Right. Donald Trump was a shortcut. Right. And, and this is how the ruling class, of the United States is managing dissident ideas. I mean, you can say the same thing about Bernie Sanders. Right. Bernie Sanders, you know, he got up there and he he 
he virtue signaled anti-capitalism. He got up there, I want corporations to pay their fair share of taxes. Uh, you, know, you know, but he wasn't really preaching Marxism. He wasn't really preaching an ideological class struggle message. He wasn't a Marxist. He wasn't a social social Democrat even, right? He wasn't calling for the workers to control the means of production. He was just saying, I will make corporations pay their fair share of taxes. I think that health care is a right. But he wasn't, he wasn't actually preaching an ideology. And the followers of Bernie Sanders were not being mobilized to build a real organization. DSA is not a real organization. It does not have roots in the community. DSA is a campaign for the Democrats club, right? And they're not really teaching an ideology. Oh, worker co-ops are good. Yeah. And Republicans are racist, man. And I mean, they, you know, incoherent, incoherent messaging, not ideology. You can't, you know, they do not want an ideology to be espoused and they do not want an organization that sinks its roots into the community. What they want is a kind of incoherent voice that gives voice to the resentments of certain sections of the population. And then, and then leads its followers off of a cliff. And in Bernie's campaign, it led them to vote for Hillary Clinton. It led them to the Democratic National Convention. When they got to the Democratic National Convention, they lost. It was rigged against them. And Bernie Sanders said to vote for Hillary Clinton. And this, this is the game that the ruling class is playing with dissident movements. And there's people that are probably upset that I'm talking about the alt-right and all that. Well, I'm sorry. The, the alt-right, with its you know sympathy for anti-imperialist states and its rejection of the woke makeover that U.S. imperialism desperately needs if it's going to claim moral high ground against Russia and China. And, you know, I mean, the alt-right, as bad as it was, it was an upsurge of ideas that are out of line with the American mainstream, as, as wrong as they are, Okay. So if it makes you mad that I'm using them as an example, you can just say that. But, but this is how they are managing dissident movements right now, is they, they, they come up with a dog and pony show, an incoherent, non-ideological dog and pony show, they mobilize people around this incoherent, ide you know, lack of ideology, dog and pony show. They mobilize people around it. And then this dog and pony show leads them off a cliff. And then everyone walks away from the movement demoralized. And that's what they did with Bernie. That's what Trump's supporters did. That's what the alt-right did. And this is how they mo this is how they manage dissident sections of the population right now. And the way they do it is with shortcuts. It's all a shortcut. And look, BreadTube, right? Now, BreadTube was part of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Ultimately, BreadTube emerged, ContraPoints, all of them emerged. It was part of the Bernie Sanders upsurge, but it was there and they're clowns. They're clowns. If there ever was clowns, they, they are clowns. Their message is incoherent. They like worker cooperatives. There's some secret Nazi conspiracy that's taken over the government and Russia and China and Venezuela and anyone who supports them is somehow secretly a Nazi and part of the alt-right. And it's an incoherent message. And they're doing damage control, you know, and they're kind of picking up the pieces from what was left behind of the Bernie campaign. Um, you know, but and Peter is absolutely right about this, but this is how they are managing dissent in the United States right now, because ultimately the only thing that can really change is the construction of some kind of real movement. That is the only thing that will ultimately result in political changes in the United States. And that may be hard for people to understand, but unless you have what the Black Panthers had, which is geography, unless you have territory that you control, neighborhoods, unless you have what the Communist Party had, unless you have what far-right movements around the world and in the United States historically have had, unless you have a real movement, a group with a base in neighborhoods, a group that local politicians have to negotiate, a group that is teaching people an ideology, not an incoherent expression of their grievances, but an actual ideology. Unless you have that, 
you really don't have the power to change U.S. society. And historically, communism and fascism have emerged during political times of political crisis, times of political turmoil, as real ideological movements with roots in the community that different sections of the ruling class have to negotiate. And if if it gets to the point that, that liberalism collapses into fascist illiberalism, they become, you know, they create a totalitarian fascist state. Or if the communists are able to maneuver and make, a, and eventually they are able to overturn capitalist property relations. But all of these things come from real movements. And the ruling class of the United States is conscious enough to realize that any real movement is a serious threat to the status quo. That any, you know, that if, if, if the USA were to go to fascism, some sections of the capitalist class would do very well, but a lot of capitalists in the United States would be crushed, right? A lot of the ruling class would be crushed in order to make way for a full-on fascist state. Meanwhile, you know, if there were to be a socialist revolution in the United States and we had, you know, a working class revolutionary government, that would spell the end of capitalist power in the United States. And capitalism as it exists in the United States would be subordinated to the overall socialist state based in the working class and their organizations. And that any kind of real movement that has roots in the community, that is teaching people a real ideology that has power on a local level and controls geography, any such movement would ultimately, you know, be a threat to the power of a lot, if not all, in the case of communists, all capitalists. And in the case of fascists, like 50% of capitalists, right? And that's the situation. And so there's, there is an effort to make sure that we don't develop a real actual movement. There's a there's an effort to make sure that a real actual movement of any kind doesn't emerge, and instead we get rodeo clowns that eventually lead us off a cliff. And that's what's going on. And we need to keep this in mind. We need to keep this in mind because there were a lot of leftists, I even fell into some of this thinking, who thought the Bernie Sanders movement was an opportunity to get rich. They thought it was an opportunity to, to win the jackpot, to win the lottery, and it wasn't. And there were probably all kinds of people that thought that the Trump movement or that thought that the, you know, the alt-right was their opportunity to make a lot of money, to, to win, win, win the jackpot, and it wasn't. Right. And it wasn't right. And that that here's what you need to understand. The Russian Revolution was kind of an accident. Let me emphasize that the Russian Revolution was kind of an accident. Wasn't supposed to happen. The czar was fighting World War One. The Russian state was had one foot in feudalism and was also trying to be a modern capitalist country, and there was this push and pull going on, and the czar, is, the czar was fighting World War I, and Europe was laughing at the czar because of the whole Rasputin scandal, and so the ruling class of Russia wanted to bring down the czar, and so they did, and then the ruling class of Russia was divided over should they continue fighting in World War I or shouldn't they, and German intelligence, you know, they had this plan to fund revolutionaries to get Russia out of the war, and so Lenin went back to Russia with a lot of money from German intelligence and, and a lot of support from sections of the Russian capitalist class who didn't want to fight in World War I. And, and then the provisional government was facing being overthrown by the Kornilov reaction. And one thing led to another. And there was a lot of chaos. And amid the chaos, there was a historical accident where the Bolshevik party was able to take power. And the Russian Revolution should not be studied as a model of how communists come to power because it was an accident. And it happened amid a, a moment of confusion where the ruling class of the world and the ruling class of Russia largely dropped the ball. They were asleep at the wheel and there was so much crisis and a huge world war was going on and millions of people were dying and the capitalist imperialist countries were fighting among each other. And amid a huge clusterfuck of confusion, 
a real movement called the Bolsheviks that had existed but had been marginal was able to maneuver through the chaos and take power. And that's there was widespread panic among the ruling classes of the world after the Russian Revolution. J. Edgar Hoover was giving lectures to Congress all about how, you know, oh my God, the Bolshevik menace. And because nobody saw it coming, people didn't even know who Lenin was. You know, this there, there's articles. I, I looked at old newspapers when the Russian Revolution happened. The New York Times articles, they thought Trotsky had led the Russian Revolution because he was this guy who lived in New York City who was a Russian communist that everybody knew. People didn't know who Lenin was. For a while, they didn't even get Lenin's name right. Did you know that? It was Vladimir Lenin. And there was another Bolshevik leader named Nikolai Bukharin. And for a long time, American newspapers were referring to Nikolai Lenin. There is no person Nikolai Lenin. There is Vladimir Lenin and Nikolai Bukharin. But uh, for a long time, American newspapers were like, oh, my God, this guy we've never heard of, Nikolai Lenin, has taken power. What is going on here? Like, they had no idea. The Russian Revolution was an accident. It was a, it was a big, big accident on the part of the ruling classes of the world. And one of the mistakes that revolutionaries around the world fall into is they, they think it's going to happen like that. And it's not. Right. The Russian Revolution was unique historical circumstances. It was a society that was caught between Western capitalism and ancient feudalism and confused. There was a big world war going on. So everyone was distracted and one thing led to another. And the Bolsheviks aligned here and they aligned there and they maneuvered and they were able to take power. That's what happened. And it was a historical accident. It was an accident. And the ruling classes of the world have been very careful to make sure nothing like that ever happens again. However, the Chinese Revolution was not an accident. The Chinese Revolution is a much, much more accurate model for what is probably going to happen. Right? How did the Chinese Revolution happen? Well, the Bolsheviks, the Russian Revolution happened. The Soviet Union was created. And at the time, there was a huge nationalist movement in China called the KMT, the Gomendong Nationalist Movement. And it was a movement of Chinese capitalists who wanted to become wealthy and didn't want to be kicked around by the Japanese capitalists, the British and the American capitalists anymore. And so there was this widespread nationalist movement in China, the KMT. Leader of it was Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And because the KMT wanted, you know, Chinese workers and peasants to support them, their message had a social democratic or socialistic edge to it. The, the KMT movement they believed in, it was independence, democracy, and the people's livelihood. And it was, a, it was paid for by the wealthiest Chinese people who were fighting against the Japanese, fighting against the Americans and the British. They wanted control of their country. And so after the Russian Revolution, there was a a few different Chinese people that were sympathizers with the Bolshevik revolution believed in communism. And so they were advised, they were advised by Stalin and others to join Dr. Sun Yat-sen's movement and join the KMT movement. And the Soviet Union was a country and the Soviet Union provided military and financial aid to the new Chinese government and the KMT movement. And the Communist Party was aligned with the Soviet Union. So that created a moment where there was kind of an obligation on the part of the KMT movement to tolerate the Communist Party, to let them exist. And so the Communist Party started to flourish as a wing of the KMT movement. They joined the KMT movement. They were entryists into the KMT movement. The Soviet Union was financially supporting China. So there was room within the KMT movement for the communists to grow. And so the communists flourished as this very radical wing of the KMT movement. And then, and then after the communists expanded their influence and grew more popular, Dr. Sun Yat-sen died, Chiang Kai-shek came into power, and somehow Chiang Kai-shek was convinced that the communists were out to get him. He was convinced the communists were no good. So Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the KMT movement, killed hundreds of thousands of communists. And he ordered the rounding up and executing of all the communist leaders. And this was a huge step back for the Chinese Communist Party. They had controlled whole cities. They'd had representatives. They were a real movement, right? You know?
They were a real movement, but they were basically their ally, the KMT, which had been their big ally, suddenly turned on them and started killing them in mass. And so the communists, they lost hundreds of thousands of people and they had to flee into the countryside. And so the communists were in the countryside and they completely changed their tactic. And there were uprisings going on among the peasantry, among poor rural folks. Peasants were rising up against their landlords. And so the communists went and they joined the peasant movement. There was this peasant movement that was happening. So the communists joined it. And the peasants, they would fight their landlords and kill them with guns. And so the communists organized an army, the Red Army, that would, would be like an army that would participate in this peasant movement. And they organized armed uprisings and they seized liberated territory. In 1931, they declared the Chinese Soviet Republic. And they, they, they had a chunk of the country that was, you know, communist controlled. And then Chiang Kai-shek, with the backing of Germany and the United States and other countries, sent his military in there and crushed the Chinese Soviet Republic. And so again, they were forced to retreat up into the mountains. And this whole chunk of territory that they'd had, they lost and they were retreated up into the mountains. And then there were people in the Chinese Communist Party who blamed Mao for the defeat. There was an uprising against Mao within the party. They said, well, it's Mao's fault that we had this setback. And so there was a fight in the party and the communists killed other communists in this fight. But then they did the long march. A couple of years later, they were seizing liberated territory again. They were suddenly back. People thought they'd been eliminated. People thought the communists were gone and they were back. And then, and then Japan invaded China. And so the KMT party that had been killing the communists was forced to enter an alliance with the communists against Japan. So the Chinese communists fought against Japan. For all of World War II, from 1937 to 1945, they teamed up with the very people who'd been killing them to fight the Japanese. And then, after World War II, they wanted to form a coalition government. And the KMT wouldn't allow it. Chiang Kai-shek wouldn't allow it. And he started trying to disarm and, and disarm their army. So they had another civil war. And the civil war kept going. And then, this is important history here, Chiang Kai-shek had this great idea. He was going to confiscate the gold of all the rich Chinese people and give them a new Western paper currency. You know, in America, they don't carry gold around. They've got dollar bills. And, you know, so Chiang Kai-shek went to all the rich people in the areas he controlled, and he gave them paper currency for their gold. And he confiscated all their gold, and he gave them paper currency. And then his currency crashed. And Chiang Kai-shek, all the rich people that were aligned with Chiang Kai-shek lost all of their money. And at that point, some of them started saying, shit, this, this Chiang Kai-shek guy is completely incompetent. You know, the communists are bad, but, you know, we, we might still have our money if they were in charge. And Mao started meeting with some of these wealthy capitalists. And before the Red Army would seize an area, Mao would go to the area and he would meet with the local rich people. And he would say to them, you know, this communism stuff, I don't believe that. I'm just getting money from the Soviet Union. I don't believe in communism. Don't worry. After we come to power, you'll keep your millions of dollars. You'll keep your land. Trust me, it'll, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And they believed him. And it was, over the, it was due to Chiang Kai-shek's currency crash. And it was due to the Chinese communists winning over various capitalists to understand that they were not a threat. That ultimately, in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party was able to declare the People's Republic. They were able to drive the KMT out of the Chinese mainland. The KMT fled to Taiwan. And, and Mao kept his word. For the first, in the 1950s, there were still millionaires in China who didn't have their property touched, right? I mean, for the first 10 years of the, of the People's Republic of China, there were a lot of wealthy capitalists who were aligned with the Chinese Communist Party who never had their property nationalized and all of that. And it wasn't until the 60s that China started moving to actually create a fully socialist economy. But for the first for the first decade or so, it was a it was you know, it was the Communist Party was in charge, but the government 
very much. They built infrastructure with aid from the Soviet Union. They, they, they had the Barefoot Doctors campaign and bringing people medical care, etc. cetera. Um, but for the first decade or so, you know, they didn't mess with the capitalists of China, right? And that this is what you have to understand. The Chinese Revolution was not an accident. It wasn't the Bolshevik Revolution. It wasn't like there was a bunch of chaos going on, and then this one group that no one had ever heard of got money from the Germans and maneuvered here and maneuvered here, and they came to power. The, Bolshe the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 was an accident. And, and that, that's not to denigrate the fact that Lenin was clearly a brilliant leader because he was able to maneuver within all of that. And, and the moment where they were asleep at the wheel, he was able to take power. I mean, you can admire you can admire the fact that they made the most of it. But in a lot of ways, the Bolshevik Revolution was an accident. The Chinese Revolution was not an accident. It was a long, long, long march of a group, an organization, a movement gradually building itself up, gradually building itself up. That's what the Chinese revolution was. It was the first, the communists were an obscure sect. Then they joined the KMT. Then they were fighting in the countryside. Then they were aligning and fighting Japan. Then they were, and, and it was a series of negotiations and compromises the whole time building up community power. And that's what they were doing the whole time. They were seizing geography. They were, they were having areas that they controlled and they were building up community power and building a real movement. And they were working class people, peasants that they were teaching their ideology to, and they were serving them on a local level and dual power structures were created. And gradually, gradually this alternative government, this communist party, this communist movement that had real roots among the population was teaching a very clear ideology gradually over the course of decade after decade after decade and strategic alliance here and strategic alliance there, gradually, step by step, was getting stronger and stronger and stronger and maneuvering here and maneuvering there and maneuvering here and making a compromise here. And, and finally, after all of that, you got the People's Republic of China that was created. And even then, for the first 10 years, the People's Republic of China they tolerated a lot of capitalism. They were the government, but in order to stay in power, they had to, to keep a lot of the powerful people that had been under the old regime. They had to let them stay. They let those millionaires keep their millions. They, they didn't touch certain capitalist property. I mean, even for the first 10 years they're in power, they didn't, they didn't even fight a lot of the capitalists because they didn't want to have another civil war, right? So, so this is what you have to understand is that, that a real movement a real movement that can actually take power, six roots of the community, and there are any shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. And this may sound incoherent, but I'm trying to get you to understand because this applies to us. What we are doing is not what BreadTube is doing. We are not trying to just be rodeo clowns and entertainers. We are not trying to put on a show and lead you off a cliff. We're trying to build a real organization. That's what we aim to do. The Center for Political Innovation is a real organization educating people about socialism, educating people about Marxism, bringing people together to have community with each other, to be part of a community, to know each other, to build a network of people who believe in anti-imperialism. And that is the kind of thing that could lead to a real movement someday. That could lead to there being geography, there being areas where there are, you know, there are regions that are that are anti-imperialist and communist. This is the kind of thing that could actually lead to some kind of real movement happening. However, in order for us to do this, and thank you. In order for us to do this, we have to understand that this is a long march. 
And we have to understand that there are no shortcuts. And if we get caught up in shortcuts, we will get led off of the cliff. That's what will happen. If we become a shortcut, we will get led off of a cliff. There is no shortcut. It's difficult. It's hard. And we will remain fringe. We should be prepared. We shouldn't expect huge surges in membership. That would be great. That would be great. But we shouldn't expect huge surges in membership. We shouldn't expect that overnight we, you know, we recruit millions and millions of people. And we should expect to make alliances. And we should expect to be an entity that persists to exist. That is the main thing. That we are there. That's the point. The point is that we are there. And that we continue to be there. And we continue to be there. Doing anti-imperialist things, putting on anti-imperialist conferences, teaching our anti-imperialist classes, classes. And we bring people into our community here. And we bring people into our community there. And we bring people into our community here. And we bring people into our community there. And that we're just there. And that people know that we're there. And we're not going to blow up the way their rodeo clowns blow up. And we're not going to explode in popularity. But we're also not going to get led off of a cliff. We're going to just continue to exist. And just continue to do our thing. And just continue to be marginalized and just continue to be hated and just continue to be canceled. I'm going to be canceled over and over and over again. They're going to cancel me a hundred times. They're going to cancel me a hundred times. And eventually they're going to stop canceling me because they're going to realize that I just keep doing stuff. I just keep existing. No matter how many times you send out the memo that I'm Satan and that I eat babies, I'm just going to keep doing stuff. And we are going to exist on the margins of U.S. society, gradually building up our community, gradually winning people over, gradually expanding our membership, gradually winning people over, gradually getting our ideology out there, gradually winning people over, until it will get to a point that we have enough resources that there's going to be areas where our ideas are so pervasive that local politicians kind of have to pander to them in order to get elected. There's going to come times where people, people just can't ignore us any longer. And then there will probably come a crisis where the ruling class realizes that the only way they can settle the scores among themselves as if there is some kind of real movement that supports them. And we will be that real movement. And we will have that territory. And we will have that ideology. And we will have that core of dedicated people. And that will be our moment. But we need to come to terms with this reality. We are going to get canceled over and over again. And we're going to keep going. We're going to get canceled over and over and over again, and we're going to keep going. And we are going to exist, and they are going to pretend that we're not there, but we're going to keep being there. And we're going to keep building up our forces, and we're going to keep maneuvering, and we're going to keep bringing people in. And we are going to lay the foundations, not of a clown show, but of a real movement. And this is what you need to understand. And it's, it's not easy, but it's really the only way that you can actually win. 
you have to do this. You have to do the hard work of building a real community of solidarity, a real movement. You have to teach a real coherent ideology. You have to give people something to be part of. You have to, you have to build a real community. A lot of people say we seem a lot like a church. Well, I agree. Churches are a great model of community power. Right? Do you think there's a politician in an area and all local pastors are against him? You think he's going to win? No. Right? Churches are organizations that serve communities, that teach people an ideology, and wield a lot of power and influence because of it. The church is a great model to study. Right? I think the fact the more we look like a church, the more we we provide people what churches used to provide them, community, a place to belong, an ideology, something to believe in, you know, the more that we do that, the better shape we are in. So yeah, instead of perform, you know, set, instead of setting up a, a whiz bang social media clown show that leads you off a cliff, Instead of being, you know, putting on some internet show where I talk like this and then you go to Charlottesville and then that's the end of it. Instead of, you know, putting on some kind of bread tube, incoherent Republicans or Nazis clown show that gets you to vote for Bernie and then, you know, dissolve into into pessimism. We are just going to keep plugging away. We are going to build our community because this is a way that we can actually win. This is an actual serious strategy for building a movement because what ultimately will lead to socialism coming to the United States is going to be a real movement. And building a real movement is very difficult and it is not easy. And it is a very, very long, painful process. And there's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. And there's no, there's no magic. There's no winning the lottery. Yes, there are moments where all of a sudden things come crashing through. There are moments where all the hard work that you've done suddenly manifests itself. Yes, those things happen. However, however, there's a lot of careful building up. One of the main things we're doing in the Center for Political Innovation right now is we're training people to be teachers. We're training people how to use this book to convene classes in their neighborhoods. We're training people how to give the Saxton lectures so that they can give the lectures. We're training people how to learn the important concepts that you'll notice the fake socialists never talk about, like the tendency of the rate of profit to fall or overproduction. We're training people how to explain Bolshevism and party of new type and how to explain imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, how to explain why China is a socialist country despite having, despite having a market sector and a lot of income inequality, right? This is what we're doing. It's not easy. But we are, we are training people to be organizers, training people to be teachers. And thank you, Jason, for the super chat. I do appreciate it. This is not easy work, and we should expect that we won't see the payoff very soon. And we should expect that there will come along various shortcuts, and we'll be frustrated that we don't have the success that those taking those shortcuts have but we shen, then shouldn't be surprised to watch those shortcuts lead off a cliff like the Bernie Sanders campaign or like Charlottesville or like, or like January 6th because shortcuts don't lead where you're going. They're not really shortcuts. They are diversions. They are maneuvers by the establishment to control dissent. But ultimately, it is real movements, real actual movements that lead to real change. And that is what we are trying to create. And that it's not easy. It's not easy. But we're going to do it. And the fact that I'm on here every night streaming, and you all are on here every night listening to me, 
the fact that we are planning a conference in March, the fact that we have different operations we can engage in and different allies we can strategically align ourselves with, the fact that we are the only, the only socialist current that has not either dissolved into wokeness or kept its ideology dead, dead in the 20th century, but we have a 21st century understanding. We're the only people that are putting forward. Exactly. Exactly, Ryan. We're the only people that are putting forward the message of the global communist movement. The global communist movement, they don't sound, they don't sound like, you know, Bolshevik groups and Trotskyites a hundred years ago. And they don't sound like wokes. The global communist movement sounds like us. You go to Venezuela, the communists in Venezuela, they sound like us. Right. You go to you go to China, the communists in China, they sound like us. You go to Russia, the communists in Russia, they sound like us. You know, you go to you go to Africa, the communists in Angola, the communists in South Africa, the communists in Zimbabwe, they sound like us. The Islamic revolutionaries in the Middle East, they sound like us. Right. The way we talk. The updates, the understandings that we've brought. We understand 21st century socialism. We understand the city building tendency. We understand the problems of dialectics. We understand what's going on. The fact that we do that and we maintain our momentum, we continue doing what we are doing as hard as it is. And we continue to exist doing this while the global current that we represent is getting stronger around the world. Around the world, people who believe what we believe are the majority. China, one in four human beings is in China, and the ruling ideology of China is our ruling ideology, is our ideology. We believe in the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party, the city-building tendency, right? Socialism with Chinese characteristics, that is the kind of scientific understanding of socialism that we have. Right? Go to Latin America, our kind of socialism is very widespread. You go around the world. We have a viewpoint that is the majority viewpoint in the world at this point. Among people that are highly political, understand politics, 21st century socialism, anti-imperialism, constructive optimistic socialism, that's the majority view. However, in the West, when we are inculcated with propaganda against it, it's going to be a minority view. But we're going to keep believing it. And our forces around the world are going to keep getting stronger. And we're going to build up our community. And eventually, as things in the United States deteriorate, and things around the world in countries that have broken out of Western capitalism continue to rise, we're going to become more and more important. And other forces will emerge that start to get it, right? There'll be people within the power structure. There'll probably be people in the military who start to get it. There'll probably be people... People in the labor movement who start to get it. There'll probably be people, you know, people in academia, people, people in different sections of society that will start to get it. Maybe it won't sound the same way we sound, but they'll start to get it. We just have to be prepared to do the hard work. That's what we have to be prepared to do. So on that note, folks, before we do our roll call, I actually wanted to show you all a video, right? Right? I recommend that, by the way. Three volume history of the Chinese Communist Party. That is scientific socialism. Bread tube is not. Go read the history of the Chinese Communist Party. But before you all, um, before we go to the roll call, uh, you know, North Korea, a socialist country that's under attack that I've been paying close attention to, I feel like, you know, the hope that we can be involved in efforts to bring peace to the Korean Peninsula are important. They just released a beautiful video, a beautiful video called P the first snow of the year in Pyongyang, right? They just had the first snow of wintertime in Pyongyang, the capital city of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. They released a beautiful video. So I just want to show you, and this is a video where you're seeing daily life in North Korea. If someone walked around New York City on the first day of the snow of the year, you know, they would have a video like this. This is, this is Pyongyang the first snow of the year in Pyongyang.
So there you go. I just thought that would be a great way to end the opening remarks for tonight. All right. Names and locations, folks. Names and locations. I will call you out as I see you. Names and locations. Who is with us for tonight? Names and locations. Names and locations. Who's with us? Who's with us? We got Yonatan Marani in London, the United Kingdom. Must be late over there. Thanks for joining us, Yonatan. We got Klaus Kinski in Germany. We got John Witte in Houston. Che Guevara in New Mexico. Timoshenko in St. Louis. Nate in Chicago. Cool stuff. Sage Rage. We got uh, Brighton in Vancouver. JT24 in Mississippi. Klaus in Berlin. Kansas City, Ryan. Temple City, California, Stephen in Riverside, California, St. David's, Bermuda, Auckland, New Zealand. We got Raleigh, North Carolina, Lori in Oklahoma, Alex from Brazil, Tristan in Maryland, Chester, England. We got Mark Utica. We got Chicago, Jason Hunt. We got Los Angeles, Jonathan C. We got Yuri in Buffalo, New York. We got Peter Piotr in Russia. We got Jeff in Grand Canyon, Arizona, Pittsburgh. We got we got Greensboro, North Carolina, Jeff in Delaware, Bob Troy in New York, Allen in Chicago, Catalonia, Spain, Mindanao in Midwest, Olympia Logic, Gilbert in Arizona. Good stuff. We got parts unknown. Brighton is in parts unknown. Parts unknown. Nina is in Independence. Very good. Long Beach Lightning Trail is in Long Beach. We got Ryan. Class Analysis in California. Kieran from San Diego. We got Beachman Bolshevik in Kentucky. We got Carl in Washington. Good stuff, folks. Good stuff. Marcos in Valencia, Venezuela. Very, very, very good. Very, very, very good. Names and locations. We got Cleveland Pirate Alex. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anyone else? Names and locations. We got Bill from the United States is in New Hampshire. Welcome, Bill. Welcome, Bill. We got James in Thailand. Mahadri. Mahari. Yonatan's last name is pronounced Mahari. All right. Very good. We got David Rennie in Hamilton, Ontario. We got Tomahawk Outlaw says Bill. That's right. He's in the restaurant. He wants to get out of there and he's shouting at the waiter. Bill, Bill, bring the bill or the check. Sometimes you say the check, but there you go. Charles in New York, Puerto Rico, David Rodriguez, Castaner. Oh boy. Good times, folks. Good times. All right. Let's start answering super chat questions. Besides communists in power, what are examples of communists who matter? Communist Party of India, Marxist in India, in Kerala. They're a great example of communists who matter. Um, there's other examples. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Chile, you know, you have a lot of communist groups that are in the neighborhoods and in communities. Um, well, let me let me think. Um, you know, Lebanon, right? They're not communists, but there's an organization in Lebanon. I think you know who I'm talking about that they have a huge amount of influence. They're half the government, basically, and they have community power. Right? If you look at them, um, you know, the Greek Communist Party, KKE, right? Portugal has a very strong Communist Party, with a lot of bases and communities. They're part of the ruling coalition. Uh, you know, uh, the PT in Mexico, the Labor Party in Mexico, they're very, very powerful and influential. Um, you know, there are, there are communists around the world who matter. Right. Um, you know, in various parts of the world, you know, in India, there's a number of communist groups that matter. Right. India is a very big country. And it's not just, you know, in Kerala, the Communist Party of India, Marxist is the main party there. But the Communist Party of India also has influence in Kerala. But then in India, there's also something called the Socialist Unity Center. So SUSI. Right. And they have a lot of influence and they have whole neighborhoods they control and, and they are a very influential group. And in Bangladesh, there is a communist group. Its symbol is the hammer and sickle. They're called the Socialist Party of Bangladesh. And they are a, a huge party that controls whole neighborhoods, has a huge amount of influence, has a relationship with North Korea. They have a lot of influence. They certainly matter. Um, so there you go. There you go. There are many there are many revolutionary forces around the world that they matter. Right. Um, they have a lot of influence. So there you go. There you go. There you go. All righty. All righty. 
Is the PSL a tanky party? Well, that depends on what you mean by tanky, right? The term tanky is a derogatory, originated as a derogatory term for communists who defend the existing socialist countries. It started out during the British, during the Cold War, there was a divide in the British Communist Party. Uh, and there were some in the British Communist Party who sympathized with the French Communist Party and the Italian Communist Party and the Spanish Communist Party and wanted to denounce the Soviet Union and its interventions in Czechoslovakia, its interventions in other places in Afghanistan. And they were called Euro communists or the Euros, right? Because they were siding with the big communist parties in Europe that were moving away from aligning with the Soviet Union. And then there were parties that existed, or there were people in the British Communist Party who continued to defend the Soviet Union and its military interventions and its foreign policy and the way Soviet foreign policy was portrayed in American media was these big tanks. They would just show these big, scary looking tanks rolling over the border. So they used to call the hardline communists, they used to call them tankies. The idea was they, they supported hardline Soviet foreign policy, which was represented in American media and in Western media by big tanks rolling over the border. So the idea was they were tankies. They support the tanks, the rolling in of tanks, right? And that started to become a slur on the internet, right? They used to call it, they started, it was a big thing on the internet. Oh my God, there's all these tankies, they're red fascists, whatever. So I made a YouTube video called Why Be a Tanky? It was a YouTube video that I made and it took off. And now there's a lot of people on the internet who call themselves tankies. So the, the question is, is the Party of Socialism and Liberation, the PSL, is it a tanky party? How do you prevent co-optation by liberals cosplaying as leftists, i.e. Occupy Wall Street? Is PSL a tanky party? Kind of. Uh, they are, their, their roots are tanky. You know, the PSL originated, it was a split from the Workers' World Party. Why don't we just talk about this for a little while, right? This is what's good about these streams is that I talk about this stuff and no one else talks about this. So for those of you who may not be aware, the Workers' World Party is a hardline communist party. I was a member of it for eight years from 2007 uh, when I was a 19-year-old college student until 2015, I was a member of the Workers' World Party. I spent my 20s as a member of the Workers' World Party for eight years. Um, and, you know, the Workers' World Party was a, it was a, a originally a Trotskyist group, but it evolved into an attempt to build a slightly more radical version of the Communist Party USA. And as, you know, as China's politics shifted and a lot of people who'd been Maoists were kind of lost. And as the Socialist Workers Party, the SWP that had run all the big anti-war protests during the Vietnam years collapsed in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, the Workers World Party took on the task of stage managing anti-war protests. And they built something called the People's Anti-War Mobilization. And they built something, you know, they eventually started the All People's Congress and that they would stage manage big anti-war protests. The people who wanted to keep the flame of the 1960s anti-Vietnam War movement going would go to rallies organized by the Workers' World Party. And the Workers' World Party, they would set up the stage and they would arrange for the speakers and the microphones and they would put up all the posters and they would get the permits. And that was what they did. That was how, and that this is an important thing, right? If your organization isn't doing anything, it's not relevant. And so a lot of the communist groups from the 60s were not relevant anymore, right? They didn't have any function. Well, the Workers' World Party discovered that their function, the way they could remain a functioning organization as the global communist movement was declining, is that they could be the stage managers of left-wing rallies. And so throughout the 80s, they organized anti-war protests. During the 90s, they organized big left-wing rallies that were pro-union and against police brutality and against U.S. military interventions. And, you know, they organized... For, you know, every year, basically, the Workers' World Party would organize some big rally in Washington, D.C. And everybody knew they were the ones putting it on, but they would give it some other name. It would be the All People's Congress or the People's Movement Assembly or the Movement for a People's Assembly or whatever. Right. And that they, they were just very good. They would organize these very big rallies in Washington, D.C. around trendy around 
leftism. They would keep leftism alive. They were supporting, you know, it was around, it would, and sometimes these rallies were like insane. Like there was a rally that they had, uh, you know, when Ronald Reagan, you know, was no longer president and George Herbert Walker Bush became the new president. They had a rally in Washington, D.C. against George Herbert Walker Bush called We Won't Take Four More Years. I mean, it sounds like a, a rally by the Democratic National Convention, right? Or the DNC, but we won't take four more years. No, Say no to Reaganism. And they had a rally against four more years of Reaganism. We won't take four more years. It was against George Herbert Walker Bush, right? And that that, that was just what they learned to do, was to have rallies. So fast forward to 9-11. 9-11 happened. The September 11th attacks were a big deal. Uh, and... Uh, you know, they, it was pretty clear after 9-11, the USA was going to intervene around the world and that the U.S. population after 9-11 was being psyched up for military interventions, right? That, you know, eventually, first they invaded Afghanistan and then Iraq. And so Sarah Flounders and Brian Becker and Gloria LaRiva and Teresa Gutierrez and Larry Holmes and other leaders of the Workers' World Party who had been working with Ramsey Clark, the former U.S. Attorney General, who had, had become an anti-imperialist, they founded, like a few days after 9-11, they had a meeting and they started their new group, was called ANSWER, Act Now, Stop War and Racism. And they had a big office at that point. They had a loft that they, they, they had a loft in Manhattan. And they decided, look, we're going to get out ahead of this. We're going to organize the protest movement against whatever war the USA does after 9-11. So they started ANSWER, which stood for Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. A-N-S-W-E-R, ANSWER. And the main leader of ANSWER was Brian Becker. And Brian Becker was a guy who'd been in the Workers' World Party for a long time. He's from upstate New York. He was part of like a church group that became interested in communism and eventually he became an atheist and he joined the Workers' World Party. And, you know, he was just he was just a Workers' World guy. But he, they, they had been organizing protests in D.C. for years. They'd gotten very, very good at getting the permits, et cetera. So Brian Becker and others, they formed the Answer Coalition. And you'll remember that the Iraq war was an interesting moment because the American ruling class seemed pretty united around it, right? Nancy Pelosi was for it. Joe Biden was for it. Hillary Clinton was for it. All the Democrats were for it, pretty much. But there was Dennis Kucinich, who was kind of a hippie. He was against it. But Europe was really against it. And that's what you have to remember. Europe was really against it. France denounced it. Germany denounced it. Almost all the NATO countries were against it, whereas, you know, Britain went with the United States, the United States and the American political establishment was for it. But Europe wasn't. France, Germany, all of them were against it. And so because you have a lot of American businesses that are tied in with Europe and because of the fact that, you know, that, that Europe, I mean, is part of the first world, you know, there was a big section of the first world that was against it globally. The world was saying, no, the USA doesn't have the right to invade Iraq without the UN's permission, without, you know, even NATO's permission. The USA can't invade Iraq. Globally, there is a whole amount, huge amount of opposition, even though the US ruling class from Nancy Pelosi all the way over to the Republicans, they all seemed united around it. So in that kind of situation where the world is against something the United States is doing for the most part, but the United States ruling class is for it, you're going to have huge opposition, right? I mean, I mean, there's going to be all kinds of people in America who are going to read the news from France or read the news from Germany or going to look at it and are going to agree with the world. And yeah, it's not going to be average working people, though. It's going to be college professors, intellectuals, people who travel to other countries. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, in the black community, there was a lot of opposition because in the black community, there's an opposition to the status quo. So, when the USA invaded Iraq, it was very clear there was going to be, there was going to be opposition to it. And so the PSL, I mean, they weren't PSL yet, the Answer Coalition, they got out in front of it and they got the permits in DC and they had the rallies and they did a good job of it. Um, and the Answer Coalition started having big rallies in DC. And after the Answer Coalition was doing these rallies, 
you know, the Democrats and the Communist Party USA started their own group and it was called United for Peace and Justice. And it was bigger and it had a lot more money, but the rallies were much, you know, much tamer, right? It's a lot. Some of the rallies were not even against the invasion of Afghanistan. They were just in, against the invasion of Iraq. And, you know, it was much more watered down. And so you had the Answer Coalition, which was like this radical anti-war group. And then you had, you know, DSA and CPUSA had formed United for Peace and Justice as this like lame, moderate anti-war group that was trying to keep up with Answer. You know, so it was kind of a strategic move. And the Answer Coalition was, they were having the more radical rallies and the moderates from the Communist Party and the DSA were having to keep up with them. So it was good on their part. And the Answer Coalition, because they were the ones leading the big anti-war protests in the United States, uh, you know, they started raising a lot of money. And there was a lot of old boomers who, you know, were against the war and remembered the good old days of protesting the Vietnam War. And they opened their checkbooks and gave them money. And there's a lot of people in Europe and other places who were opposed to the U.S. military intervention in Iraq who opened their checkbook and gave them a lot of money. And money started flowing into the Answer Coalition because, to their credit, the Answer Coalition was doing the right thing. And so Brian Becker, you know, Brian Becker is a slick businessman, right? His his. His gig, his grift, is he puts on anti-war rallies. So he's bringing in millions of dollars from around the world. And people in France and Germany are opening their checkbooks. And people in the United States are... And, and Answer has a huge budget to put on these anti-war rallies in D.C. Has a lot of money. Well, the Workers' World Party, as I can attest, as somebody who was a member of it for eight years, sucks, right? It is internally a nightmare. It is completely dysfunctional. Their newspaper is in black and white and is unreadable, right? There is a huge amount of internal dysfunction and anyone in the group who gets anything done immediately gets attacked. And there's this culture of like, even before the cancel culture started, they were doing cancel culture in the group. Everyone's accusing everyone else of being racist and sexist. You can't get anything done. So Brian Becker, who's leader of the Workers' World Party, and he's presiding over millions of dollars coming into the Answer Coalition. Brian Becker's like, screw this. I'm starting my own party. I got the money. Why, why do I need to sit around and be part of this dysfunctional piece of crap organization? So he he and the Chicago branch of the Workers' World Party and the D.C. branch of the Workers' World Party and the L.A. and San Francisco branch of the Workers' World Party left and they became the Party of Socialism and Liberation. And they're better at it. They have really nice signs. They have glossy magazines. Their newspaper looks better. It is a smarter version of the Workers' World Party. It is a sexier, you know, better at getting the permits. Better. It's like, you know, I mean, it's like Brian Becker, from what I've been told, he was always reading marketing books, you know, how to win friends and influence people, he, you know, and he was like a smart businessman. And he realized he's probably cynical. I doubt the guy even believes in communism anymore. But he just, after being in this group for years and being seeing the Soviet Union fall and all that, he got cynical. And he realized, OK, this is this is my grift. This is my gig is putting on anti-war rallies. Right. And so, you know, he said, I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do it right. And so he and his his crew of people that wanted to put on anti-war rallies with him, they walked away and they started doing it right. And Larry and Sarah and all these old, you know, old, incompetent, cancel, you know, dysfunctional people that weren't as good at it as them. You know, they yelled and, you know waved their hands in the air and were really angry. How dare you? You know, they didn't care, right? They're like, hey, you know, this is our grift. This is our business. And, uh, you know, they started, they they went into business on their own, right? You know, instead of working at a dying, a dying old store, uh, they started a store of their own. Okay. That's, that's where PSL came from. That's what PSL is. This is the problem with PSL, is that they never politically evolved past that. Because, in 2008, the U.S. economy crashed, right? In 2008, the U.S. economy crashed. Living standards vastly decreased. Um, and all of a sudden, middle America 
was alienated for the first time in a long time. Average Americans were mad at the, the establishment. Ad, average Americans were mad at the status quo. And suddenly, you know, Alex Jones was very popular and, and average Americans were realizing that the wars were wrong and all of that. The Answer Coalition made no effort whatsoever to recruit any of those people. Why? Because that's not where the money comes from. The money that they've figured out, their business is staging liberal protests. And so, you know, just like the Workers' World Party, just like the Communist Party, during the Obama years, when suddenly middle America is waking up and there's all kinds of anti-establishment ideas among the population, and yet instead of, you know, winning these people to socialism, PSL, just like Workers' World, just like CPUSA, pointed at all these Americans that were mobilizing against Obama or, or whatever and just said, you're a bunch of big fat racists. You're racist. That's what you are. You're racist. Racist. You're racist. And that's what they did, right? And so because that's what they do. They stage rallies for liberals. The liberals all support Obama. They didn't support Obama. They ran their own presidential campaigns, but they want liberals to come to their rallies. And they have no interest in going to average people. They don't want to knock on doors in Kansas and win the people there to socialism. They don't want to do that hard work. They don't want to like teach people Marxism. They don't want to do what CPI is doing. They don't want to go out of the movement to the masses. That's too hard, right? Instead, they want to make money. And they make money by staging liberal rallies. And so they continued staging liberal rallies. And if you, you know, and all these average Americans were waking up and turning against the status quo, they made no effort to influence them because they're all racist, 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 racist. And then you'll notice that as Obama was president, increasingly wokeism being, you know, Black Lives Matter and and, you know, anti-fascism and all this, all these leftist ideas just started becoming a defense of the status quo. That's what they turned into, just a defense of the status quo, just a defense of the government. Right. And, uh, you know, just, you know, I mean, you know, basically uh, the idea was that, you know, that average Americans, uh, you know, that were against the wars, they were being accused of being conspiracy theorists. And Donald Trump was saying anti-war things and average Americans who were mad about the FBI, you know, that the left is defending the FBI, et cetera. So then in the aftermath of that PSL, again, they can't change their tactics, right? They can't do that. And so after January 6th, the Brian Becker went all in and he gave some insane interviews where he said the problem with the Democrats is they didn't they didn't have a bigger crackdown after January 6th. They should put all Republicans and Trump supporters in jail. You know, I mean, it's like he's calling, you know, calling it sedition and he wants sedition charges against them. And now we're, the woke element is leading us into a police state and leading us into World War Three with Russia. And Brian Becker and the PSL are trying to get on board that train. And it's hilarious because these wokes all hate PSL. PSL because it supports Cuba and Venezuela and because it's, you know, and they've even compromised on the Russia and Ukraine. They, they like condemn Russia's intervention in Ukraine, right? And they like, they, they like, you know, it's like, well, Ukraine is bad. NATO is bad, but Russia is also bad. And we're, they're trying to do this plague on both your houses. Does that matter to the wokes? Do the wokes go, oh, Brian Becker and PSL, they're doing both your houses. They're fine. No, they call them Nazis. Right. All the wokes hate PS, hate PSL because PSL isn't woke. It's holding on to some element of anti-imperialism. But all that PSL has ever been set up to do and all they know how to do, all that PSL knows how to do is stage manage liberal rallies. And that's all they're ever going to do because that's where the money comes from. Right. The last thing PSL is ever going to do is get out of the movement to the masses. Right. If they hear someone say anti-communism, right, if people say to members of PSL, you say to members of PSL, uh, you know, oh, the Soviet Union killed 100 gajillion million people. They say, shut up, racist. Right. And they called the Canadian truckers fascists. Right. There's a group of Canadians that are resisting the vaccines and are standing against the government and all that. And they just said, fascist. That's what you are. You're fascist. You know, and, you know, and that's all they do. Right. Is that they just pander to whatever liberals are doing, whatever the liberals say, they try to say it louder and get the permit and reserve the stage. You know, that's what they do. Right. And it used to be during the Cold War, one could do that and be a tanky. 
because the Democrats were softer on the Soviet Union. The Democrats were skeptical of anti-communism. Now, the Democrats are more anti-communist and more pro-imperialist than the Republicans are. So PSL is gradually becoming less and less tanky. And their position on Ukraine is just the beginning. And pretty soon, you know, you can bet that if, you know, things escalate with Taiwan, you know what side they'll have to, you know, find a way to be on. And that over time, PSL is going to concede one position after another. And on top of that, PSL, because it has embraced, embraced wokeness, wokeness destroys organizations. It destroys organizations politically. And PSL, they have sex allegations once a week. Everyone inside the group is accusing everyone else of being a racist and a sexist and being a transphobe and being this and that. And that PSL, you know, they've got a lot of money left over from, you know, the, the answer coalition. And they've got some people writing them checks. But after a while, the wokeness in PSL will cause it to further deteriorate. And the people that they're pandering to are going to hate them more and more and more. And eventually PSL will crack, right? And, you know, it, I mean, it is what it is. PSL ain't going to be, PSL is a relic of the past. You know, they are an attempt to, it's Marxism, right? I mean, they're trying to be stage managers of the movement and the movement is gone. And liberalism exists and liberalism is more pro-imperialist. So, you know, PSL will eventually fall apart. You know, I mean, they have this, yeah, they have breakthrough news, which is unwatchable, completely unwatchable, completely unwatchable. It's just a bunch of woke garbage. I mean, it's like, there's nothing communist about it. It's just a bunch of woke, you know, it's like, oh, you know, so, I mean, it's just a bunch of woke crap. I can't even watch breakthrough news. Right. Um, and it's just, you know, PSL. PSL will fall apart. And if you criticize PSL, which I have, right? I have told PSL people my criticism, I've written articles. They have one answer, right? If you disagree with PSL, if you tell a member of the PSL what I've just said about how we have to get to, out of the movement to the masses, et cetera, this is what they will say. <clears throat> yeah, well, we actually do something or... <clears throat> You don't do anything. That is their argument. That is what they think. That is their entire response to any criticism of their organization. Yes, well, we actually do something. Or you don't do anything. What does that mean? I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, you know. But that is what they say about every other communist group. They don't do anything. And we are good because we actually do something. And it shows you how stupid you have to be to be a member of the group. We used to say the same shit in Workers' World Party. And it's like, you know, the Communist Party, do they do anything? Yeah, they campaign for Democrats. So this idea that, oh, well, the Communist Party doesn't do anything. No, they do something. They do something. But what they do is not good. You know, and you say about, oh, you know, the CPI, Caleb, your group, you don't do anything. No, we do stuff. We have conferences, we, you know, but you don't approve of what we do. We do stuff. I'm on here doing something right now, right? We're doing stuff around the Korean Peninsula. We're, we're doing stuff. But they don't want to have that conversation. The only group that counts for doing anything is them. And it's, it's just assumed that the only way you can do something is to do what they're doing. The, the thing is, they, PSL has been doing what they do for decades. They've been doing what they do. And... It has the situation has gotten worse and worse and worse. And we're now facing woke fascism and they're supporting it. They're supporting it on the grounds that, um, you know, on the grounds that, you know, oh, well, if you don't support it, you're a big fat racist. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, it's. It's ridiculous, right? So, you know, that is their one argument is we actually do something right. And that's it. That's all they got. And. And so, yeah, PSL, at this point, yeah, they're kind of a tanky party. But the way they talk about Russia, the way it's like, the, you know, it's like somehow Russia intervening to help the people of eastern Ukraine and Donbass is not a good thing because, you know, you know, Putin said negative things about Lenin in a speech. Oh, OK. All right. Well, there you go. 
there you go. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, and that, you know, you know, China is not socialist. It's a dictatorship of the proletariat, but it's not actually socialist. And just so you know, we don't approve of China. It's like, okay, okay. Right. And give it time, give it time, give it time. You know, they, they will inevitably the wokeism within their party will just rot them out. We'll just rot them out. But in addition to the wokeism just eating them from within, their politics is going to become even even more irrelevant. They made a choice, right, around the vaccine mandates. They made a choice around January 6th. No, they are more loyal to liberals than to anti-imperialist countries. And because of that, they're, the liberals are going to get more and more pro-imperialist and their grift of running liberal rallies um, you know, is going to become less and less fruitful and, you know, they'll be gone, but they exist right now. So there you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Anyhow, that is my answer to the PSL question. All right. Uh, chapter three of 18th Brumiere. Well, Let's get it out. Let's read chapter three of 18th Brumiere. Jason, you have some interesting questions, but we have Karl Marx's pamphlet, 18th Brumiere of Louis Bonaparte. We will read chapter three. There's chapter two, continuing, continuing to chapter three. On May 29th, 1849, the Legislative Assembly convened. On December 2nd, 1951, it was broken up. This period embraces the term of the constitutional parliamentary public. In the first French Revolution, upon the reign of the constitutionalists, succeeds that of the Girondins. Upon the reign of the Girondins follows that of the Jacobins. Each of these parties in secession rests upon its more advanced elements. So soon as it has carried the revolution far enough not to be able to keep pace with much less march ahead, of it, it shoved aside its more daring allies who stand behind it, and it's, it is sent to the guillotine. Thus, the revolution moves on upward. Just the reverse in 1848. The proletarian party appears to be an appendage to a small traders or democratic party. It is betrayed by the latter and allowed to fall on April 16th, May 15th, and the June days. In its turn, the Democratic Party leans upon the shoulders of the bourgeois Republicans. Barely do the bourgeois Republicans believe themselves firmly in power, and they shake off these troublesome associates for the purposes of leaning upon the shoulders of the Party of Order. The Party of Order draws its shoulders, let the bourgeois Republicans rumble their heels and throw itself upon the shoulders of the armed power. Finally, still of the mind that it is sustained on the shoulders of armed power, the Party of Order... The party of order notices one fine morning these shoulders have been turned into bayonets. Each party kicks backward at those that are pushing forward and leans forward upon those that are crowding backward. No wonder that this ludicrous posture each loses its balance after having cut the unavoidable grimaces, breaks down amid singular somersaults. Accordingly, the revolution moves along a downward line. It finds itself in a retreating motion. Before the last February barricade is cleared away, the first government authority of the revolution has been constituted. This period we now have before us embraces the motliest jumble of crying contradictions. Constitutionalists who now openly conspire against the Constitution. Revolutionists who are admittedly constitutional. A national assembly that wishes to be omnipotent yet remains parliamentary. A mountain that finds its occupation in submission that parties it presents defeats with prophecies of future victories, royalists who constitute parties conscripti of the republic and are compelled by the situation to uphold the hostile monarch houses and adherents, passions without truths, truths without passions, heroes without heroism, and a history of events, the official collective genius of France brought to shame by the artful stupidity of a single individual. The collective will of the nation often speaks as though the general suffrage speaking through the expression of prescriptive enemies of public interest. We saw that in the ministry, which Bonaparte installed on December 20th, 1949, the day that his ascension was a ministry of the party of order. We continue. 
<sighs> we're just he's describing the confusion in French society amid a capitalist crisis. He's describing the role of social democracy. He's describing the role of, of various factions in the ruling class fighting with each other, all in the lead up to the coup by Louis Bonaparte and how the bourgeoisie, uh, you know, that, you know, is basically, you know, reversing itself and how the liberal society is collapsing into illiberalism, right? Seldom was an act, an, an act announced with great noise with greater noise than the campaign contemplated by the mountains. Seldom was an event trumpeted ahead with more certainty and longer beforehand than the inevitable victory of democracy. This is evident. The Democrats believe in the trombones whose blasts the walls of Jericho fall together. As often as they stand before the walls of despotism, they seek to imitate the miracle. If the mountain had wished to win in the parliament, it should not appeal to arms. If it had called arms in parliament, it should not conduct itself parliamentarily. If the friendly demonstration was meant seriously, it was silly not to foresee that it would be met with a warlike reception, right? He's describing no party exaggerates to itself the means of its disposal. Just describing the collapse of democracy, right? France deteriorating into a full-on, into a full-on Bonapartist regime. The riot of June 13th limited itself, as we have seen, to a peaceful street procession. There were consequently no laurels to be won for it. Nevertheless, in these days, the poor in heroes and events, the party of order converted this bloodless battle into a second Austerlitz. Tribune and press lauded the army as the power of order against the popular multitude, the impotence of anarchy. Right? He's describing the fighting that happened, the chaos, the confusion within the ruling class that led ultimately to to Bonaparte declaring himself to be the new emperor and the declaration of a new French empire. Very good. Louis Bonaparte's relatives paid for my ancestors to come to the U.S. in the 1940s. That's pretty wild. All right, next question. Am I familiar with Verdi Pitch? No, I'm not. And I, I don't, I'm not a LaRouche person. Is that the LaRouche thing about how he doesn't accept certain notes and something about music? Is that what that is? I'm not a LaRouche person, right? They're doing, they're, they're the only people that are playing a good role as anti-war. You know, I mean, they're doing a good role in the anti-war struggle, but I'm, I'm not an adherent of LaRouche thought, right? I, I draw a lot from his work uh, on economics and stuff, but I am, I'm not a LaRoucheist. I'm not a member of the Schiller Institute. I am not a, a LaRoucheist. Is that what that is? The Verity thing? Is that Verity pitch a LaRouche thing or not? I don't know. Um, so there you go. I don't know what Verity pitch is and I'm not familiar with it. All right. Someone said we should do a watch party with Shostakovich and his fifth symphony is the best. Okay. Well, I'm all for putting music onto these kind of streams. So yeah, Shostakovich, watch party. I'm down. I'll have to go listen to the fifth symphony of Shostakovich. There you go. Limitation and co-optation of legit working class orgs is a big part of Dutt's work on fascism. And that is correct. That is correct. Um, revolutionary Eritrea and the HOA in general. What is HOA? Um, all right. Okay. We'll talk about that. All right. Okay. And... Um, you know, limitation and co-optation of legit working class orgs is a big part of Dutt's work on fascism. And that is true, right? That these community organizations, the Horn of Africa, got it. Um, you know, that is true that if you look at fascist movements historically, you have working class community organizations that are formed as the basis of community power. And that as the bourgeoisie is heading toward collapsing into illiberalism and establishing a fascist state, they often will kind of reluctantly, after trying to suppress such organizations, they will reluctantly, um, you know, start to seize hold of them. And that's true. That is absolutely true. And that part of the rise of Nazism was that the Communist Party of Germany had built all kinds of unemployment councils and all kinds of labor unions. And the ruling class of Germany had just heavily suppressed these community organizations. And that after the Blut May, 
of was it 1928, I believe. 1928, you had the, you know, the violent May, the communist uprising in the Wedding district of Berlin. There was a, a kind of a feeling among a lot of communists in Germany. There was kind of a uh, demoralization. And you had a number of these kind of community organizations becoming sympathetic to the Nazis. And the Nazis, you know, unlike normal times in Germany, the Nazis were a, a political force that was being supported by the highest levels of the bourgeoisie, but was willing to embrace movements, right, community organizations, because of the fact that those movements, those community organizations uh, would be useful in collapsing Germany into a full on fascist state. Um, and that is, you know, part of fascism is a section of the ruling class gets to the point that, OK, right, instead of, you know, instead of mobilizing fascists, you know, to just go to Charlottesville and go off a cliff. They say, all right, you guys are setting up infrastructure and community and we need infrastructure and community if we're going to seize control of the government and collapse into full on fascism. And so, yes, part of the rise of fascism is that working class and community organizations that are generally just suppressed by the bourgeoisie get kind of embraced and used by the bourgeoisie to collapse society into full on fascism. All right. Lots of folks call him Nikolai Lenin. Yeah. Yeah. I think Reagan in a speech called him that. So there you go. Right. The legacy of deceased Chinese leader Jiang Zemin. Well, didn't Jiang Zemin at one point say that the goal was to uh, to eventually adopt a Western system? And isn't he the one isn't Jiang Zemin's teaching? He talks about the three representations, the three representations. I believe, and that, you know, he took Deng Xiaoping theory uh, a, a little bit further. And in the 90s, China was moving in a much more free market direction. And that in a lot of ways, I would argue that Xi Jinping is moving away from a lot of what Xi Jin, uh, Jiang Zemin did, I would argue. But I, I mean, I am not an expert, I guess. Um, but my understanding is that Jiang Zemin was kind of a move away from the communism of Deng Xiaoping theory and that Xi Jinping is moving back towards the Deng Xiaoping theory of communism. All right. All right. How do you prevent the co-optation of liberals cosplaying as leftists, i.e. Occupy Wall Street? Well, I was part of Occupy Wall Street, and I will tell you that Occupy Wall Street was, it was very much staged from above. Um, you know, there, there, there had been, you know, the Tea Party was coming to kick around the Democrats, right? Obama was trying to pass some like mild reforms to stabilize capitalism in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And the Tea Party was making it impossible. The Tea Party Republicans, they were like making it impossible. So then Adbusters, which has ties to, you know, the U.S. intelligence apparatus, right? Um, three represents from Mussolini. Yeah, I'm not sure of that. Not sure of that. Uh, but anyway, um, but anyway, uh, ad busters, which has ties to the American intelligence apparatus, um, you know, they put out a call to Occupy Wall Street. And before it had even started, it was being promoted by mainstream media. You know, Bloomberg had a press conference and some mainstream media reporter got up and said, Mayor Bloomberg, I understand that uh, there are some people planning to occupy Wall Street. Will you allow them to engage in such protest? And Mayor Bloomberg came out and said, well, I'll, I'll protect their free speech as long as they don't break the law. And it was like it was being hyped from the beginning. And then there was actually it was a great example of social media manipulation. Right. So like Occupy Wall Street, it started and it was going to die. And then on live TV. They showed them all being maced by the police. I remember that. They had a march and on live TV, the police were like macing them and they showed like live on CNN and MSNBC, the police, you know, engaging in brutality against them. And then the next Tuesday, I believe it was, I remember this, um, they put out, it was all over Twitter. There was going to be a free concert by Radiohead in, in Zuccotti Park. And it wasn't true. Radiohead never showed up. But I remember this the day that they like announced that Radiohead was going to come to Zuccotti Park and play a free concert. And so there was like a, a bigger crowd in Zuccotti Park. It was like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people piled into Zuccotti Park because they thought there was going to be a Radiohead concert. And like everyone in the New York City area got an ad on Facebook, free Radiohead concert in Zuccotti Park. They thought the band Radiohead was going to perform. 
And it was like they were just trying to pile people in there with social media. It was very, very, very well staged from above. Um, and there were certain mechanisms that were built into Occupy Wall Street to make sure that it did not, you know, lead to anything like no demands. They just pumped everywhere. No demands. We can't have demands and no demands, no demands. And like the logic that they would use, like the reason we can't have demands is all the government has to do is meet those demands and then there'll be no revolution. And like, I remember like saying, so like we were saying that Occupy Wall Street should demand full employment, right? Um, you know, give everyone a job. And like, I would listen to these people and they'd say, well, then all the government has to do is give everyone a job. And I'm like, you think the government's just going to give everyone a job? Right? Like, do you realize, first of all, that would be, that would be like very difficult to achieve. Second of all, if you actually achieve that, if through mobilizing big protests, you got the government to give everyone a job, that would be a huge boost to activism because people could say, wow, wow, we could actually get something done. We could win a victory. And that would encourage people, right? Kind of like the civil rights movement. The fact that the, you know, the, the Civil Rights Act was passed, that encouraged many people to become activists because it's like, wow, we can get the Civil Rights Act passed. We can win a victory. Right. You know, victories tend to inspire people. So, you know, but it was just it was it was a mobilization. And I will I, I swear, like the ruling class, like not just the ruling class, the intelligence agencies, you know, they used to talk about how back before we all had phones. Right. People had this thing called a Rolodex where they had like cards with people's names and phone numbers on them. The CIA, they have a Rolodex. Right. They have a Rolodex of weirdos. Right. I and I don't know where they come from, but they have a Rolodex full of weirdos. Right. And it's like during Occupy Wall Street, the CIA people, they were just going through their Rolodex. And every weirdo you ever heard of was getting called up and asked to come to Occupy Wall Street. I don't know where they found these people. Right. There's protests in New York City all the time. And these people don't show up. But like, you know, all the hippies from upstate New York and half of California, it's like every left wing democratic party ish liberal weird buddhist you know drum playing every weirdo ever got the memo come to zuccotti park uh and you know it was it, yeah it was being organized by the highest levels of the ruling class and yeah the communists were there and they were part of it and they they but they weren't running it i mean they and and it was it was staged from above to be like the democratic party's response to the Tea Party. Um, it was understood that in the aftermath of the financial crisis, there was going to be some kind of economic activism in the United States. And it was also understood that the Tea Party was kicking around the Democrats too much. So the first like take one was this awful thing called the rally to restore sanity. Do people know the rally to restore sanity? Uh, that was, you know, uh, John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. And they had this like concert in Washington, D.C. that was like against political extremism or something. And it was just, it was like arguing that we're too extreme in our politics, the rally to restore sanity and Colbert and John Stewart had this rally in DC and Ariana Huffington paid for the buses to bus everyone to the rally. And it was, it was not, um, not left-wing in any conceivable way. I mean, it was, it was just a, like an open air concert by John Stewart and, and Stephen Colbert to do their stand up comedy um, but it was an attempt to be like pushing back against the Tea Party and it didn't work. And so they did Occupy Wall Street and they started Occupy Wall Street. And then after a couple months, they wanted it to stop and Occupy Wall Street kind of kept going. And that was, you know, there were a lot of people who just got politically activated. They got excited about doing something. They saw Occupy Wall Street on MTV or on MTV, M MSNBC, and they did something right. Um you know, and there were a lot of people who ended up joining communist groups because of Occupy Wall Street. I was part of Occupy Wall Street. I was in communist groups before that, obviously. But, you know, but it was not a communist uprising. And our mistake, I would argue, is that Occupy Wall Street should have just been seen as a recruiting opportunity. That's all it was for communists. It was a recruiting opportunity. The ruling class is fomenting unrest for their own reasons. So go there and win people to socialism and recruit them to be communists. That's the only opportunity that was there and the tea party should have been viewed the same way right and you know but instead there was you know this feeling that the tea party are a bunch of racists and we, we're going to support the democrats against the tea party 
stupid. And there was also this feeling that, oh, Occupy Wall Street, if we reserve the permit or something, we can become the leaders of it. No, you won't. No, you won't. No, it should have been viewed as a place to go and witness socialism, witness communism, win people to join our revolutionary movement. That's all Occupy Wall Street was. It was just a place where there's a lot of people that are mad at the system and open to hearing different ideas where you could go and talk to people, right? And that's really what we should view these mobilizations by the ruling class as. That's the point of my opening remarks. There is no shortcut. Out of the movement to the masses. We have to build a real community of solidarity. We have to build a real movement. And in order to do that, we just have to win people. It's a matter of winning people. And you can't ride something fake. You can't. You can't look at the alt-right, let them all off a cliff, right? And MAGA and Trump, let them off a cliff. And Bernie Sanders, let them off a cliff. And Occupy, let them off a cliff. You just have to view all these places where people are that are at odds with the system against the status quo. You have to just view it as a recruiting opportunity. That's all you have to view it. View it as a recruiting opportunity. Go there and win people to the the real the real anti-imperialist current, the city building tendency. That's all we should view these things as. No trying to take over the movement, out of the movement to the masses. Occupy Wall Street, the Tea Party, MAGA, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. All of this is a recruiting opportunity for real communists and nothing more and nothing more. Just you have to view it that way. And the second you fall into the illusion of thinking that one of their movements is going to lead anywhere good, you you are in putting yourself in danger because when they go off the cliff, you go off the cliff with them. Right. And when Occupy went off the cliff, communists went off the cliff with them. I mean, they, you know. They got all wrapped up in that. And that's when we started to see communist groups starting to get wokeified, right? It was during Occupy, right? Because that's when the wokeification of communist groups really escalated. Um, you know, the, the wokeifying of Occupy Wall Street was hilarious. Let me just point this out, right? You know, I've pointed out that Land Back, let me just, I'll just go off on this. Land Back, Land Back is a demobilizing thing, right? that if you start with, oh, we're all living on stolen land, we're all Euro settlers, we don't have a right to be here. Okay, it's true. The United States was stolen from the Native Americans. Native Americans deserve reparations. They deserve the right to have independent territory if they want it. You know, I mean, fine. But we're living on stolen land is one of the biggest... It's a diversion. It's just a diversion. And I saw that during Occupy. You know? I was I sat on sat in on many conversations where somebody was explaining that we couldn't call it Occupy Wall Street because the land was already occupied by the white people because it was stolen from Native Americans. I, I sat many conversations. I sat through people explaining. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Can't occupy Wall Street because it's already occupied. You have to call it decolonize Wall Street. I mean, and I've and and then in West Virginia, when the teachers' strike happened in 2017, the teachers of West Virginia went on strike. The Workers World Party branch was dominated by third worldist kids, and they didn't support the strikers. And they put up a statement on the website, on the Facebook, and on the website saying that the teachers of West Virginia shouldn't go on strike. They should pay reparations and one settler, one bullet. Right. So, I mean, and, and it's like one of these people tried to own me. That never happens. Caleb land back is never used as an excuse to demobilize movements. Yes, it is. Right. If we're all just living on stolen land, which we are like what? So what are we all supposed to leave? I mean, that's not going to happen. So we're, all all white people and black people of, of North America are supposed to leave. That's not going to happen. But there's always some hippie. If you go to like a, a leftist gathering, who's like, man, we need to recognize this is stolen land, man. We shouldn't be protesting here because this is stolen land. It's like, so what? Like, what is your point? It's just like a, it's just a diversion. And I've seen that over and over and over again, right? We can't build a real organization. 
We can't have a socialist movement because we're on stolen land, man. We just got to like sit in a circle and like smoke a bong and think about the native people, man. It's all cursed because it's on stolen land, brother. It's like, you're right. You are right. You are correct. And, and, and it, it's just a demobilizing tactic. And I've seen, I've seen this over and over and over again. I mean, you know, if people want to have a, like a white guilt circle jerk, I can't stop them. They can do it. Go ahead. You know, you're free to do that. And you're not wrong. But like, I want to actually see America get to socialism. I actually would like to see imperialism be defeated. I'd like to see the forces of forces of righteousness that are defeating Western capitalism and imperialism triumph. I would like to see the United States reborn on socialist principles and having a white guilt circle jerk in accomplishes this in no way. It does not get us any closer to that. Right. And it makes you feel good on Twitter though. Oh my God. Caleb's against land back. I'm not against it. I mean, if indigenous people want their own territory, fine. If they want reparations, fine. But I'm against having a white guilt circle jerk instead of building a socialist working class movement. That's what I'm against. There are no shortcuts, folks. There are no shortcuts. All right. And Becker was a host on Sputnik. He interacted intelligently with people all across the political spectrum. And now he's forgotten how. Well, there you go. Well, it was his job on Sputnik Radio to interact with people of different backgrounds. Now his job is to lead a party that is pandering to wokeness and is collapsing further and further into wokeness every day. So there you go. There you go. All righty. The importance of Norman Bethune. Norman Bethune is a is a an American or a Canadian doctor who joined the communist movement went to Spain, supported the Spanish Republic, and then he ultimately uh, went to China and he cut himself while performing surgery, got infected and died. One of Mao's most treasured speeches is a speech he gave honoring Dr. Norman Bethune. Um, yeah, he's a national hero in China. Uh, uh, a Canadian communist doctor who went went to fight and stand in solidarity with the Chinese people. And, you know, great hero. I mean, I don't know what more there is to say about it. Uh, great hero of the communist movement. I've used his story many times before to make a political point. So there we go. All right. And revolutionary Eritrea and the Horn of Africa. Well, the Horn of Africa, if you look at all those borders were drawn by the imperialists. Why is there this tiny country called Djibouti? Well, it's there because it's strategically located for military bases. Ethiopia, right, was ruled by Haile Selassie. Eritrea was being backed by the Soviet Union and China fighting for its independence. But then you had the Derg come to power in Ethiopia. And the Derg was a pro-Soviet government and some of the Eritreans joined in the Derg and accepted their territorial autonomy deal. But then some of the other Eritreans then started getting backing from the CIA and from China and the United States to fight against the Derg. And then in the 90s, the Derg was overthrown and so the like the Maoists, right, that were being backed by the United States and China against the pro-Soviet Derg, they're the ones that are currently running Eritrea. Um, and they are, I, I mean, they don't they don't seem to espouse Marxism, Leninism anymore, but their roots are in, you know, their roots are in, you know, hardline Maoist communism. And they are called the North Korea of Africa. They they run an anti-imperialist government. It's a very, very, very small country, and it's very, very impoverished. Uh, but they are friendly with China. They're friendly with Russia. Uh, but Ethiopia is moving in that direction as well. A lot of African countries are friendly with the anti-imperialist camp. But the Horn of Africa is very strategic for obvious reasons. Um, you know, China's only overseas military base, I believe, is in Djibouti. Uh, so there you go. All right, folks. Uh, that's where we're ending for tonight. I'll be back tomorrow. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression with the people of various countries, have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. While the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. 
Good night and good luck.